We have so many tools in our training toolkit, and I think a lot of us don't understand why we need to use all of them or even how to program in a smart way that allows us to do it for, for long periods of time and adapt to the stimulus. But in a nutshell, we've got you know resistance training, high intensity interval training, moderate intensity, continuous training. For me, those are like sort of like the big three. And then of course, you've got your mobility, your yoga, those kinds of things. I think we need to be thinking about like, we've got this cardiovascular training, we've got resistance training. How we incorporate the two together over a week is really important. and the intensities of our cardio is also really, really important. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Howdy friends, great to be here with you. I hope that you've been keeping well. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In this episode, Drew and I reconvene to talk about some of the previous episodes on the show, including the episode with Dr. Richard Johnson on fructose and Kieran Rooney on exercise and energy systems. We step through exercise with a very practical focus in mind, offering two examples of potential weekly training programs, depending on how much time someone has. We also share studies of the week, get a few things off our chest, and leave you with some podcasts and shows we recommend listening to. As a reminder, if you're listening on audio, this episode and all episodes of The Proof are available in full-length video on YouTube. Also, as we mentioned in this episode, this is the best place to leave us comments or ask questions related to a specific topic. This is me and Drew Harrisburg. Please enjoy. Here we are in control. Actually, we did pretty well the other day. With Rooney? Yeah. Yeah, that was tough. Tough we'll, setup. We'll, um, we'll come back to Rooney and let everyone know all about that episode shortly. Yeah. Welcome back, mate. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me again. This is what, the third or fourth of these type of episodes? The, yeah, maybe the fourth. People have been asking, where's Drew? Really? Lots of people, Amazing. mate. So a uh, crowd favorite. I'm happy that's to hear for that. sure. I'm happy to hear that. I've also heard that the uh, nickname Science Hill has stuck a little bit. I've seen a few in the comments. Yeah. Thanks for that. We have to bring that back. It's <laughs> fading away. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, uh, I'll let you be the judge by the end of the day, the, the, uh, the audience. I think there's a bit of science that we'll get through. Yeah, always. Um, so, uh, we, we've been in Bali between our last episode and this one. Mm -hmm. That was your first time in Bali, actually. First time in Bali. What which, did you think? What, 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 what did you think? Like, what expectations did you have, if any, before you went? And how did you find the whole experience? Well, from what I'd heard going into it, it was very mixed. Some people said it's the best place in the world. Others were like, Bali, why are, we, why are you going there? What are you thinking? Right. And most of the people who said that, the latter, were going to the sort of like real touristy spots. Mm. I didn't go to these spots. Obviously, I was with you the whole time. But like Kuda yeah. or Seminyak now. Yeah. People were like, why would you, why right. would you want to go there? It's not the place to go. But even, even those spots, mind you, you'll find plenty of people that have a lot of fun there. And sure. you, know, you yeah. can probably find someone that enjoys, you know, there's, there's a, there's, there's a, for every place that, that um, we can go and visit in the world, there'll be people that have been there and really loved it and people yeah. that maybe didn't have the best of times. True. I tend to enjoy it everywhere I go. So I reckon I would even love those spots, especially for the mm. surf. But yeah, going into it, zero expectations. Had no idea what to expect. Um, the heat hit me as soon as I got off the plane. Mm. And then the culture shock hit me about two minutes later. Uh, the, first, the first thing that sort of struck me was obviously the streets are chaotic. There's right. no rules anything goes so i was in the in the van with with that awesome driver that you organized i forgot his name but what yo, a champion. yo man yo man what a champion yeah. he was great the what are the four thing, names do you remember the four names oh dude come on um there's katut katut no that's yo man <laughs> i don't know do you remember all i of them? should know all of them by now <laughs> well we're probably going to be uh, seeing them in a, i think in a Made, months. um someone's going to to jump into the comments and let us know yeah uh, but they're beautiful, beautiful people. Anyway, oh, I carry on. Yeah, no, just the sweetest people. But so we're, we're in the van on the way to the villa and it was you know, around midnight, I think, or close to it. Right, yeah. And we're driving down this, the busiest street I've ever seen. 
and a dog steps out off the footpath, if you want to call it that, into the road. And I was like, I was like, whoa, whoa, watch out, man. It's yeah, a dog. Yeah. And, and just, just to paint the picture here, you're on your own at this stage. Yeah. I was already there. Yeah, so exactly. you've never been to Bali, come yeah. out of the airport, driver picks you up, you're in the car for the first time seeing all of this, but you're, you're not experiencing that with anyone that's been there before. Yeah, and I, and I and I know that there are dogs in Bali, but I didn't understand that they are like road smart. Like they understand right. how to read the streets and yeah. the drivers of the vehicles respect mm. the dogs. Like it just works. There's right. something about the chaos. It's 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 yeah. almost calculated chaos. It works. And he just started laughing at me. He's like, "Man, you're gonna see lots of dogs." Mm -hmm. But it's I was like Dennis. trying to protect. Yeah, I was trying to protect the dogs <laughs> while we were driving. <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, we get to the villa and um, nearly fell in that water. <laughs> you nearly I fell in it. I gave you a heads up. I know. I still nearly fell in it because it was pitch black and obviously you just, you're stepping on these stones to get to the villa. But I, I survived that. And then, yeah, and then the next day was just exploring and getting feel of the culture. And I mean, high level, food was unbelievable. Like mm. you, you warned me that the plant-based uh, eating there is off the charts, but I off was not expecting this. Good, yeah. It was way better than I thought. I think it's the best uh, destination in the world for variety of plant-based food. Yeah. It's everywhere. And it's high yeah. quality. High quality. I mean, th there was zero processed food mm. where we were. I know we ate so well. Just whole, I mean, we eat whole food here, but there's temptation for even just a protein bar here or there. Bali, just whole foods. Mm. Um so I loved all the meals we had. Favorite restaurant? Oh, Put you well, on the spot. It's probably the place we went. Shady Shack. Shady Shack every day, <laughs> twice a day. That's a reliable place. It was really good. But it's hard to, it's hard to choose a favorite. I did really like the vibe there. Um, and then, yeah, we, we had that hilarious, I don't know if you want to call it a, a mishap, but that surfing incident that we oh, decided right. to do was pretty funny yeah. on day we one. We should tell people good way to that. kick off the holiday. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we decided we wanted to surf, and we went to check out the main surf spot. Was it Old Man? Old Man's. And it was just too busy. Like, the, it was just lots of beginner board riders. It felt right. a bit kooky. And I wanted the experience of mm. having a wave to myself. Like, right. to me, that's the ideal Bali experience. Yeah, I think busy is, is an understatement. Yeah. Like, busy is like the pass in Byron Bay. Right. This was just Traffic shock jam. a block. Yeah. You were going to be hit in the face with a board. For sure. Um, yeah, and I mean, I've grown up surfing in Bondi, so I'm used to crowds. But when I saw that, I was like, there's no, there's no way. I want my first experience to be a wave to myself where I don't have to fight with a thousand people to get away. Mm. So we- He's picky about his waves. <laughs> I'm, I'm a wave snob. <laughs> so we jump on our scooters and you take us on a, it must have been a 20 minute scooter It was ride. all about the journey though. It was a great journey. It was. We went up, we went, when I say we went up north, we actually just went to like the next- suburb yeah um but, but it was still a nice ride yeah, through the rice fields and yeah we um we went up to one of the breaks in prayer or maybe just just, just a little bit north of prayer yeah. i think um but yeah you can continue that story yeah and no, i mean we we got to a part where we were on the beach but there was just no surf hire there was no yeah. tourist noah's track. bar noah's bar that's that was it. the bar yes right so if, if anyone's going over there and you find noah's bar yeah that's where we were so and we, a few boards for rent. Well, that's the thing. So we look out, we see a wave breaking, perfect little wave, but mm -hmm. there's no one out. Too good to be true. It's always too good to be true. And when you, any time that you go surfing and there's no one out and it's a perfect wave, there's, there's something going on there. We decided anyway to just grab a couple of boards that were on a board rack at Noah's Bar and they'd been sitting there unridden for, it had to have been years. They were no wax, mm -hmm. no leg ropes mud and dust that was a mistake them. right there right <laughs> that was because one of many i was on a plane i think since then and there's like a, a surf life saving australia kind of lifeguard documentary it's like how to not die not in to the do. water and it's like first thing you do if you go to water that you've never been to yeah. and there's no one out there find some locals yeah. and speak to the locals <laughs> okay so we skipped that part um we grabbed these boards again no leg rope no wax they haven't been used in forever and we're looking out at the waves and I, I, both of us had this gut feel like something was wrong. Like we shouldn't go out there. <laughs> no, no. Like we, we, and we, can't, we knew that there was, there was a reef. Yeah, we could see around. for could sure. See you could see the reef and as the wave would come, sort of, sort of after it crashed and the water would go back out, you could see bits of reef sticking out. Well, like I said, look, there's definitely reef there, but if we're smart about this, we should be okay. 
And then we see one local in the water. And that was that, that when I saw him, it was like green light. He was carving it up too. Right. He was like dead set pro. Mm. And we're like the kookiest beginners on foam boards. <laughs> Without a leg. <laughs> anyway, we paddle out. Five strokes in, I scratch the reef and I've now my forearms cut off. I'm like, okay, it's shallow. Like we're talking from fingertips to elbow. That's how deep it was. We paddle out the back, both of us, and we're sort of sitting there and it's beautiful sunset, warmest water you, you've ever felt, perfect waves rolling in. So everything felt great. And then it was time to try catch a wave. And we, we see this local guy come, up, come towards us and, and I said to him, I'm like, mate, is it shallow? He's like, yeah, be, be very careful. Because the other thing we did wrong, which I just realized after, it wasn't even high tide. Mm. We yeah, surfed on tide. like mid to low tide yeah. on a reef. Very silly. Anyway, long story short, I lose you. Yeah. I look back, you're, you're done. Mm. I can't see you. I was done. Yeah. Well, I'm like, has he drowned? Is no. He, like, I had I no was, idea. I was done. It was <laughs> way too shallow. Yeah. And I made my way back in. Even getting back in was hard no, to try fun. and get in without dying. You got a wave, like you got a wave on your head, right? And then you, yeah. you pretty much just paddled in. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this, this looked much better from shore. Uh, and then I, I, I <laughs> you sort got of, a wave. I eventually saw you walking up. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, he's safe. I'm just going to stay out yeah. here and pick like the safest possible wave I could get. I waited for the, like the a set to come in. I took the first wave of the set because it's usually the smallest. And I got it survived paddled in one wave and that was it that was my first surf in bali um, things improved a lot after that which we'll get to when we were right. at the retreat I had yeah. some of the best waves of my life but it was a fun first surf i mean it was definitely yeah. memorable yeah so that was when we were on the more the west coast yeah i guess of the lower part of bali for anyone who's thinking of the geography mm. and then we went over to the east coast if my geography is yeah. right yeah where we went to Karamas and that was where the retreat was that we facilitated. It was in a, at a place called Commune. Um, Fond memories. Yeah. I'd been there before and I knew, uh, I think I said to you, this place is amazing. Such a good facility there. Unbelievable resort. Again, I'd never heard of Commune, didn't know what to expect. You said to me that there's a great wave there. Mm. Um, but I didn't realize the quality of that right. wave right, right there. I mean, the, the way it's set up is unbelievable. There's a WSL comp usually there. It wasn't this year, but usually it is. Yeah. I mean, if it's good enough for the pros, it's good enough for us. And, and the, the right. beauty of this wave is you can be in the pool or having lunch on the deck and 30 to 40 meters away is this perfect wave breaking on a reef where you don't have to like squint your eyes to see what's going on. It's like a show. You've got this like front row seat to like this arena of surfing so it was just so cool to be just sitting there having lunch and see a great wave and go oh, man, they definitely out. built that resort like wayne identified the break and then yes. built the resort in front of it very smart right it's a good move um but it's a great place to go even if you're not surfing oh, facilities absolutely. are incredible absolutely um great for running a retreat what did you think of the retreat i loved it it was a it was a Many firsts for me on this Bali trip because that was my first retreat as well. Mm. Not just as one of the coaches, but as, even as a guest. I've never been on a retreat like that. Um, it was just everything that I would want in my own holiday. Like People laugh at me when I go on holiday because I exercise eat once well. or twice a day, eat well, spend time in nature. Mm. But like even the this type of training I do on holiday, people are like, dude, take your foot off the gas. What are you doing? Like have a day off, relax. But that is what relaxes me burning yeah. myself out and training hard makes me so relaxed. Mm. So to be around 50 people who also felt that way, it was like, ah, oh, okay. It's the same. That's, I'm the same. Like yeah. when I go on a holiday, it's not to get away from training. It's to get away from the other things in life, right. you know, and, and take, take the foot off the accelerator in terms of work and exactly. my, my attention to admin and all of that stuff. Yeah. But I still feel like I need to sweat every day. Yeah. I mean, I just think, what are the things that make me feel my best? And why would you not want to feel your best on holiday of all places? Right. So just try, just and train. And the food okay. there was, you know, Big Chef. Yeah, Big Little He's Chef. He's a character. Wow. So there's a chef there at Commune. He goes by Big Chef. Um, he's from the local village. Most of the staff there are all from the local village, Karamas. And he's amazing. Like a couple of years ago, I sat down with him. He developed a full plant-based menu for there the health hub, mm. which they still have. It's part of their normal menu. Mm. And then he cooked for us as a group every single day. There was a lot of variety. Actually, I got uh, a handful, maybe 
maybe six or seven of his recipes. Oh, no. Right. So I'm going to make them available to, to folks online at some point. So um, we'll keep you, we'll keep you posted about that. And uh, we're actually doing another retreat, October. Yeah. Very, very excited for the, for the, the next one. Um, but yeah, if, if I were to summarize that experience that week, it was, for me, it was tr- sort of diving in the deep end because not only was I one of the coaches, but I'm heavily introverted people don't realize that they think because i go on podcasts or i have an instagram that i'm this really outspoken sort of confident guy i mean i would say i'm confident but i'm introverted i need my space and time alone to recharge the batteries when i'm around people big crowds i definitely feel some anxiety and and it drains me like i feel totally exhausted in a good way but it's it's exhausting and i need to sort of go back into my own little man cave and recover and recruit, right? And that's often when I train or I'll go for a surf or I'll do something that's in solitude, right? right. So to be around 50 people and try to give your attention all the time mm. was a test for me, a huge challenge. Uh, and in fact, when we sat down, as in, we went off into groups, we went into four groups, you know, 10, 10 odd people per coach or per facilitator. And we did some goal setting and discussions and like what do people want to get out of the week? Mm. For me that my thing I wanted to get out of the week was actually put myself in positions where I was a little uncomfortable with, you know, being the center of mm-hmm. attention or being in the spotlight or having to always answer questions or be around people all the time. And I challenged myself not to become the recluse that I would usually be and sort of escape. I challenged myself like right now I, I want to go on my own and say, go for a surf or go to the gym, but I'm actually going to sit in this space here with these people and feel everything, mm-hmm. talk to everyone and like squeeze the sponge mm-hmm. dry as much as I could which I think I did. I was pretty proud of, of that. And, and I got so much out of it. I felt right. like, it, it, I felt definitely got some growth in that way for me. Like there's a bit more confidence around people. Um, and I think that sort of, I don't know if you want to call it a skill or, but I'll be able to bring that to the next one for and sure. amplify it for sure. Yeah. You know, and there's that, I'm not sure exactly what the saying is, but the growth happens outside of your comfort yeah. zone. Yeah, 100%. Right. Um, it's funny because that was kind of the, the same sort of goal I had for the week, which was to really just give my undivided attention yeah. to, to everyone. Mm. Um, you know, I would hate to be the facilitator or coach or someone that's there and you're kind of just doing the bare minimum, you know. Um, I think it's important for people that are coming to spend as much time as possible with you and and have the opportunity to ask as many questions. And, and for me, being behind a screen all the time Mm. it's great to have the face-to-face time with people in the community yeah it was a great group of people really good group there was there were times where people were sharing like their stories of of why they're there and the funny thing was i would say the vast majority at least in the group of 10 to 12 people that i was sitting with in the goal setting my little group they're all like i'm so introverted i'm you know i get anxious in crowds and and I'm like, so why are we all here then? Yeah. Like what, you know, and, and it just shows that we all put ourselves in that position because we knew we were going to grow or, or get something out of it, even if it was uncomfortable, even if it felt like it was going against that sort of natural introverted behavior. And everyone just by the end of the week, how different was the, was the energy? So right. everyone was a little shy in the beginning. Yeah. You're sort of getting to know each other. You're learning some names. And then by the end of the week, it's like, we're family, we're best mates. Yeah, I would say I'm, I'm on the introvert side. But you can be an introvert and still crave connection and community. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Coming out the other side of COVID, yeah. I think introverts probably particularly are feeling, you know, the need to connect with other people. Yeah. I mean, that, that's very true. It's just about that, the balance. Right. Get a dose of one and a dose of the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was a great group of people. I'm sure the next one's going to be an amazing group again. Yeah. I can't wait for it in October. Yeah, October 1st to the 7th, I think. So we'll put some information into the show notes um would love to see as many of you as possible there and it's just such a fun fun time so um if you have that week available come come hang out with us yeah. learn with us eat with us enjoy the sun with us and um the ocean we'd love to see you cool so we have a few different uh papers or studies we want to get into um how have you been enjoying the show? I know you've been listening to a few of the episodes. Yeah, I've, I'm always enjoying it. I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a listener. I was a fan before I was a guest on the show. So um, I listened to Richard Johnson. He yeah. spoke about fructose. 
Mm, Actually, we've got some dates, not not pre-planned <laughs> at all, um, but there are some dates on here. How, how many grams of fructose snake. in a date? Let's see. Not 100% this. sure how many grams of fructose are in a date, but um, I know in a medium, in like an apple or a banana, there's probably six or seven grams of fructose. So in one of those, I'd say maybe a bit less, they're pretty small. Really? I see. I would have said more. Mm. We'll, we'll have well, to follow I, this up. I could be wrong. We will find out. Okay, we'll find out. Um, but yeah, well, that was an interesting episode. What did you think? Very interesting. Um, I learned a lot of new concepts that I hadn't heard of. Uh, seems like a really fun sort of friendly guy, so it was good to listen to. A couple of topics ruffled my feathers a little bit. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Richard Johnson, far more knowledgeable than myself. I am not a nutritionist and I'm not a... Uh, you know, I'm not educated in especially the concepts he was talking about, but sort of a high level takeaway for me was that he has defined what, what he calls the switch or is it the metabolic switch or what, the yeah. switch? He calls it the switch. Mm -hmm. The uh, fat switch or the, the metabolic switch. Right. Which is triggered by a fructose threshold. Is that, is that essentially what he was, mm -hmm. what he was saying? Um, which is interesting and it might, may well be a, a real phenomenon, but for me, the idea that there's this switch that is just so easy to turn on, to just become obese, like to blame or to, to point the finger at one particular, you know, nutrient uh, or… Independent of calories. Yeah, just to point the finger at something and say that you know, this is the obesity switch. Seemed really simplistic. It just mm -hmm. when I heard it the first time around, I'd probably need to listen to it a couple more times and actually like read a paper or two to understand it. But I thought it was very interesting. I just, I'm not sure if it's fair to just blame one thing for obesity. I, I really feel like it's so much mm -hmm. more complex than that. Um, and in saying that, I haven't read his book though, so I should right. probably do that, you know. What, did you, do you, what do you think about the idea of me having him on the show? Let's just oh, start with that, that before I get into, because I've had, I've had, actually I won't give you an idea as to what the kind of messages I've had, but okay. what, yeah, what do, you, what do you, how do you feel about me having conversations with someone that, that potentially at, you know, at face value, at a high level, you'd think, hmm, they're not going to be someone that Simon would have on the show. Yeah. They, 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 they have a little bit of a left field kind of view of this. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that. That's, that's, to me, that epitomizes the proof, the transition from plant proof to the proof. It's what you said. You're going to have guests on that you may not agree with, and you're going to have a discussion or a conversation, not a debate, conversation mm -hmm. in a friendly, civil manner, which is what I think that was. And I think you both pushed back on each other a couple of times in like a really respectful sort of manner, which, mm. which it was nice to see and it worked. Right. It, it progressed the conversation. Um, so I think, I think he probably said some points that you dis disagreed with and the way in which you may have disagreed and you brought up, say, another paper. Have you read this paper? So you cited studies. You didn't, you know, it wasn't like name calling and stuff right. like that. It was a really civil conversation. So- that I enjoyed a lot. And I, I'd say we probably had a bit of that with our Rooney episode as well, right. which we'll get to as yeah. we, you know, in a sec. Yeah. You know, like there, there were definitely, it's, it's clear that you're not getting guests on to confirm your bias. Right. Well, I was genuinely interested in his research that he's done. So firstly, he is actually a scientist conducting experiments. It's going to be something interesting. You're going to learn from someone that's doing that. Yeah. Whether you fully agree with them or not. Right. Um, I'd heard him on other shows. So this is kind of the rationale. I'd heard him on other shows, um, and I was aware that he had a had a new book out, right? Um, Nature wants us to be fat, yep. something like that. Yep. Um, and I listened to him on a few other shows, and I thought, wow, this guy, you know, he he's talking about some interesting things. I think obesity is interesting, right? We can agree that better understanding obesity in any way is good, um, and many people are suffering from obesity and finding it very hard to lose weight. So why not explore some, some new ideas and conversations and see if anything comes from it? Um, I was also interested that in a lot of the podcasts I'd listened to him on, I felt like he wasn't really challenged in any of his thinking. Mm. So I didn't want to have a debate because, you know, a debate can quickly turn into a rather unfriendly kind of conversation it's not going to make for great listening and he's probably never going to come back on the show. Um, I wanted to hear him out. I wanted to throw a couple things at him and see if he had thought about that before. Yeah. Um, and if he could explain why there might be certain things that I've seen that contradict his position. 
Um, so I feel like we were able to do that. And there were a few studies that I still, you know, to give everyone a summary, nothing from that conversation sort of changes my opinion on, say, the consumption of fruit. Mm -hmm. um, I find it hard to believe that fruit, even if you ate a lot of fruit, um, and I'm not talking about fruit juice, mm -hmm. a lot of whole fruit, and you had a whole heap of, of, of fructose, I don't think that's driving obesity. And I, I don't think I don't think he thinks that either. I think it's really yeah, and he sort of made that clear at the end, right? Right. I think that was a little unclear about halfway through what was his position, and if you made it through to the end, I think that was when he he agreed with what I was saying and and really made it clear that he's not talking so much about unprocessed sources of fructose. Yeah. So that was actually like a pretty good outcome. Yeah. To get there to at least clarify that. Yeah. Um. But even if I look at, say, ultra-processed foods, I think that, and you sort of alluded to it just before, I think we fall into this trap of trying to pinpoint the one thing. You know, what is it that makes ultra-processed foods um, fattening or easy to overconsume? And there are so many factors, right? Mm. Firstly, let's talk about what's not in there. Well, you've stripped out fiber. You strip out water. Usually they're low in protein. Mm. All of these affect satiety um then you go and you add artificial ingredients make them extra sweet also what about calorie density so calories per bite yes they may also add some fructose there's uh, added salt there's so many factors in there that could be contributing to the overconsumption of those foods and i tend to think that most of the metabolic consequences of those foods are due to excessive calorie consumption and adiposity, mm. which is a thought that, and I'm not saying that all of it is independent of calories. Um, I think diet quality is really important, but I sort of do side with Lane Norton that a lot of these things become way less important if you're not over consuming calories. Yeah. Um, so I guess zooming back out, I found that conversation interesting. I sent him a couple studies and hopefully we can have a part two. Something. Yeah, he he brings up some interesting, you know, thought provoking topics. He does use animals in nature a lot as as an example of this switch. I'm just not so sure we can use that and say that in humans it's the same. What about the idea that insulin resistance is actually a survival mechanism? Yeah, I I, I wouldn't really push back on that. I think that that makes plenty of sense to me. I mean, even human beings. Women who are pregnant get gestational diabetes mm -hmm. and we think that that's a mechanism to shuttle the, the nutrients to the baby to make the mother re resistant to insulin so they don't take up too much of those calories for themselves and it allows it to get, to get to the placenta or wherever it's going. So I don't mind that idea. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to look at animals and, and through an right. evolutionary lens, I think it's really interesting and definitely something that mm -hmm. gets you thinking. But I wouldn't be basing my diet on the way a bear eats because – Right. You've got to zoom out at some stage and look at health outcome data in humans. Yeah. Um, and, and, and he also mentioned that, you know, certain fruit he thinks are you know, really healthy, um, like berries and, and other fruit. Um, and he, then he goes on and mentions that there are fruit that are significantly higher in fructose compared to other fruit. And he would probably be careful not to overconsume those. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the, uh, like what epidemiological studies looking at fruit intake say the, the optimal number is, but I would bet every cent that I've got that fruit is not causing obesity. Right. And that if we all ate a bit more fruit, that we'd probably all be healthier. Than, I did put you know. the question to him uh, about fruitarians. Yeah, that's right. I forgot his answer to that. He wasn't, he he wasn't quite bit. clear. Yeah. Um, but you know, most fruitarians that I see anyway do not seem to be obese. And I, I mean, you probably know as well, a lot of fruitarians that have been eating that way for decades. Right. Like a sure. long time. And mind you, they often are consuming a lot of fruit juice as well. Yeah, true. Which is super interesting. So I think there are some sort of holes in his overall theory. Who knows? He's still conducting science. Maybe we learn more yeah. about this. But I think one thing that there's no denying is that the ability for humans to store fat and sort of unlimited fat is a survival adaptation, right? We've that that is it's it's Coming back to kind of bite us in the ass today because we have so much food availability. Yeah. But previously, for our ancestors who went through famine, 
being able to store fat was what led to survival. For sure. If you were better at storing fat when food was available, you were more likely to survive. Yep. Now, that's a great thing in, in areas where, or times where there is poor food availability, mm-hmm. put us into now an environment where we still have the same biology. Yeah. We have a mismatch. Yeah, Our environment is just, you know, it's overflowing with calories. And so many of them are just so hyper palatable and not satiating. And we have a, a movement deficit as well. So it's like this twofold. We've got calories everywhere. Yeah. But our environment's so easy to be sedentary. Right. But I think you could throw as much exercise as you want. And if you don't fix the food environment, agree. we'll still see obesity. I agree with that. Definitely. Um, I know as important as exercise is, and it's important for many, many other reasons other than just energy balance. And we'll, yeah. and we'll, um, it's going to be a big part of this show actually today, mm. this episode, I should say. Um, but yeah, that was Richard Johnson and uh, Fructose. I look forward to round two on that. I'd love to hear him address some of the papers you sent him Yeah. Uh, after the episode was over and uh, see what he says. He seems like a guy yeah. who's super open minded. He sent me an email afterwards yeah. um, and you know, thanked, thanked me for the conversation. He said he found it really um, interesting and had questions that he usually didn't get. And he received the studies and he was going to go through them. So awesome. um, stay tuned. All right. And then you've had a few other guests since then. I haven't listened to all of them. I'm trying to get through them, but I know you spoke to a mutual mate of ours, at least an, an online friend, Alan Flanagan, who... Yeah. Always makes me laugh and might be the smartest human being on mm. earth. Um, Very funny. Gosh, he's a funny guy. Yeah. Is he, he's not, so Danny's Irish. Alan is. Alan's Irish is as well. He is, okay. And he just finished his PhD. So he's now Dr. Oh, Alan so, Flanagan. Okay. And he's a lawyer as well. Yeah. And part-time comedian. Yeah. Philosopher. Yeah, yeah. Whatever else he is. Yeah, we uh, tackled, uh, we did an episode. It, it probably will be up by the time this goes up, but um, I've got so many episodes recorded i've been very busy i'm um, not sure on the the actual date that that one's out things kind of change a little bit but we actually we dedicated the episode to dairy mm. which might seem a little weird no it seems interesting i mean um, dairy has copped a lot yeah bad say it press. might seem interesting because i don't consume dairy myself yeah and i think there's a strong case from an environmental and an animal welfare perspective to limit your consumption or not consume dairy if you can. Mm-hmm. Um, but you covered health benefits I, or health. I wanted to I wanted to just look through the lens of health, right? Because, and it's just from curiosity, right? You're on social media, you see someone talking about the, the benefits of, of milk consumption um, and different types. You'll see microbiologists talking about the effect of certain dairy on the microbiome. For example, fermented dairy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll hear actually, you know, many of the blue zones consume some dairy. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can read about that. And then you'll see people in the paleo camp that will say no dairy. Now it's off the table. You would know, you would know that, mm-hmm. right? That's a pretty consistent sort of message. And I think a lot yeah. of that is about lactose, lactose intolerance. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I mean, from not just lactose intolerance, they look at everything from a primal lens and as you become an adult, you no longer drink milk. So oh. it's just it's like there's a logical thread there that the paleo and plant-based people have in common. Right. Um, Logic and paleo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that, was a, that was a low blow. That was a low blow, dude. Um, sorry to Not my paleo you. friends. Not sorry. Um, and then you have, so you have paleo folks who, who sort of steer clear, although I have seen raw milk kind of make a bit of a, come back in that, sure. that group. Um, and then you, you have on the plant-based, uh, on the whole food plant-based side, you'll have, you know, dairy raises IGF-1, dairy is inflammatory, dairy um, causes calcium to be leached out of bones. Um, Did you cover dairy, this with Alan, all of these? Dairy uh, is, increases your risk of cancer. Yeah. Dairy is poisonous. Ra 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 ra. Right. So you have a food, right? Firstly, this is a food group. And within that, there are so many different types. So sure. there's low fat, there's high fat, there's fermented, there's cheese, there's yogurt, there's milk, butter. It goes on and on, right? <laughs> so I just find it uh, a rather interesting thing to, to sort of think about and discuss where the science lies. You know, 
is 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 dairy poisonous? Is it is it bad for our bones? Does it cause calcium to be leached out of them? What are the facts, yeah. right? Whether we consume it or not, I, I do want to know what the facts are. Sure. And here's the thing. <clears throat> I think there's this almost compulsion to, if you're not consuming dairy for planetary or animal welfare reasons, to just put it in the basket of all dairy is bad and really smash it. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that does... I don't think that serves anyone well if that's not the case, mm. right? You'll, you, you will ultimately end up losing trust if that's the message that you're distributing and it runs counter to where the evidence lies. Yeah. Um, and more importantly, if there are certain types of dairy that are health promoting and if I've chosen not to consume dairy, right. I want to know why they're health promoting. Yeah. Because then if we understand, well, this type of dairy is associated with good benefits or in a randomized controlled trial has been shown to improve health compared to, to whatever it was compared to. And what are the potential reasons? Mm. Is it calcium or is it the probiotic content? Yeah. And then you can think about, well, when I'm not consuming dairy, what should I be consuming in place of it so that I'm exposing myself to those benefits? So really interesting conversation. Um, Did you talk about environment or was this mainly health focused? We didn't speak uh, in detail about the environmental effects of dairy. I made it clear that that's a strong reason why I don't consume dairy. Um, and, you know, even if you look at like the Eat Lancet, planetary health yeah. sort of diet, they have dairy in there, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of limited amount. I think I will follow that episode with uh, an entire episode or at least a, a large section of an episode looking at the environmental impacts of dairy. Cool. Have you got a guest in mind for that? Particular yeah. Episode? yeah. I think I'll bring Nicholas Carter back. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. Awesome. So Nicholas, get in touch. I'll be listening to that for sure. I'll listen to all of his ones. Um, cool. Should we talk about Rooney? Yeah. Let's, let's talk about Rooney. Rooney. Tell, firstly, who is Rooney? <laughs> uh, give, give people uh, a little bit of a Rooney, a, a Rooney bio 101. Okay. A little summary. So Rooney or Professor Kieran Rooney. Right was my lecturer when I was doing exercise physiology in 2007, 8, and 9, I think, around about those years, so a long time ago, mm. nearly 15 years ago. He was my lecturer at university, Sydney Uni. He taught biochemistry, and he was just my favorite lecturer. I got on so well with him. He's a funny guy, you've, as you, you've now found out. He's got a great sense of humor. Mm. Ex- he's just so smart. I think cool. he will quickly become a regular. Yeah, I, I feel like he could take over the internet at some point. That was his first pod. So let's give him, give him some slack there. Um, he was my lecturer and we had a really fun sort of friendly relationship. I don't know if he was a professor back then. Um, I think he's, he went on to become a professor after that, which makes me feel better because I feel like I disrespected him in many ways <laughs> back in those days. I'd walk into the lecture theater and basically I would just yell out Rooney as loud as I could. Just, give us a Rooney. I'd, I'd walk past him and I'd be like, Rooney. And then like all my mates would do it. And then it would just echo through the, the lecture hall. And he loved it. Yeah, we were, we were the, the bros. Um, so Rooney and I, over the years, over the last 15 years, have crossed paths maybe two or three times. Uh, when I was in the paleo days and a, and a big low carber, he invited mm-hmm. me to an event called Low Carb Down Under. So where- he was really low carb. Oh yeah, he's he's pretty much he understands that world. He's across the literature. I'm sure he's conducted some of his own science around that as well. Yeah, um, and he knew that I was you know publicly low, low carb guy, so mm. he tried to you know get me on the team, and I was more than happy to. He was recruiting. He recruited me, and um, he took me to a an event at Sydney Uni, I think it was, where Volek yep. gave a speech. Uh, he was talking about essentially low carb diets and endurance training and the effect of them on different, you know, glycogen and how the body replenishes glycogen and performance and whether or not it's good or bad for performance and all these things. Um, and then Rudy and I crossed paths a couple more times at, he was a panelist on, for the, that sugar film. So it was a premiere of the movie and I went to watch and there was all these questions about nutrition and he was on a, on a panel with some other experts answering those questions. And then uh, he ditched me when I went plant-based <laughs> Never invited me to another event. <laughs> so I thought I'd be the bigger man. I'd get right. Rooney on the he show. He came into the den. He came into the den. Two on one. Right. Nah. He didn't seem a dogmatic, low carb he's kind of guy. I think he's changed his tune I don't a think little he, bit. I don't think he was ever dogmatic. Right. I think that he 
he's a man of the science mm. and that he's a truth seeker. He really is. And that he saw things back then that uh, seemed to be, you know, compelling science that may have well been true science too, like great science. And he was, you know, happy to fly mm. the flag for it, which is fine. He did say, I believe he said he think he sees a, a keto diet at least as something that would be at best cyclical rather than something that you do ongoing. Yes. That was, that was something we covered in the episode. Um, but I think that he's very open-minded to have conversations like you are with, with your guests. He, he'll talk to anyone mm-hmm. about anything. And plus, he can hold his own. Mm-hmm. I mean, the guy... It was, he came in, first podcast, it was three hours long. Yeah. And we had to like try wrap it up. Like it could have kept yeah. going quite easily. Right. Actually, well, by the stage this goes up, yeah. that will have already been up. So that's out. That's out. Okay. So people may have heard, so, it, heard it already. You know, <laughs> you've, you've already listened... Uh, if you got through it, well yeah. done. I hope people do get through it because even though it was a very deep dive into biochemistry, I think we made it practical enough that people will be able to apply some of those principles that we spoke about to their programming and daily, daily life. Um, and I, I find biochemistry fascinating, although it is extremely difficult. As you'll have probably heard, he punished me on air for some of the silly things that I said. He, yeah. he laughed at me pretty hard. I obviously said things that were just not. I think that's <laughs> that's the important thing for listeners though because I, 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 you could walk into that episode and feel frustrated mm. because he's so intelligent, mm. right? But you and I were learning along the, along the way. Yeah. And we walked away from that episode with so many more questions yeah. than we had at the beginning. Um, although we learned an incredible, like, you can go into some of these conversations and you, you learn a little bit, right? Mm. But you're sort of coming into the topic having, you know, done a lot of reading and you're sort of really across it. I feel like that was one of those conversations where, at least for me personally, my base knowledge going in was nowhere near what it usually is. Yeah. And, and, and as a result, there was a, a, a sort of, a larger degree of, I'd say, friction. It was, it was a harder conversation for me from a mental perspective. Yeah. But I learned so much more. Yeah. Right? It's a, it's, that's the, the beautiful thing about those episodes is you've got to go in with humility yeah. and put up your hand and go, I actually don't know most of this stuff. I'm about to learn a lot live on air and let's see how it goes. And for me, it was, was really interesting because being an exercise physiologist, my job is to prescribe. Mm-hmm. I'm the here's what to do. Right. He's the why. And he alluded to that in when he said that his units have been taken out of the yeah. curriculum as a, as a compulsory sort of unit, I think is what he said. Yeah, like a pre For exercise physiologist. Yeah. And essentially what he's saying there is you can be an exercise physiologist and as long as you just know the outcomes, right? You just know that, okay, this type of exercise like HIT Correct. does this to VO2 max. Yes. Moderate intensity continuous training does this for yeah. uh, mitochondrial efficiency. Therefore, I'm going to program both. Yep. You don't have to know all of the finer details, but what do you think the benefit is of actually going that, that layer deeper and, and understanding more of the biochemistry? So we focused with Rooney on mechanisms, like really granular mechanisms that happen within mitochondria, like the cascade, the cellular cascade, the events that occur Those are things that I'd obviously, like I've studied it 15 years ago and over the years I've heard some of the terms here and there and like I'll read a diagram in a study and I'll kind of like gaze over it. But I I wasn't in a position, I'm still not in a position where my, I guess my biochemistry intellect is deep enough to understand that stuff. And that's why I think you need a guy like Rooney to come in and explain and bridge the gap between, okay, here's the what, here's a mode of exercise that we know has this outcome like you just mentioned. And then it's like, okay, Rooney, can you explain to us why that happens, yeah. right? And then I think when you understand the mechanisms and that cellular level, like the granular, granular detail, it can inform your programming because you, you start to see the body rather than just this big machine that can move, but as the, the systems underneath right. the layers of skin that are actually making you the train the turn. systems. Yeah. So th- that for me was the the most important part. And that's essentially one of the main reasons we got him on was that, you know, you and I, we've been really interested in training for energy systems or energy spe- specific sort of training. We've been doing it ourselves for months and months and months. 
But we had so many questions that we wanted answers to that we just, unfortunately, we don't have the depth of knowledge in the, that field to even figure it out ourselves. Like we could read mm. as many papers as we want. So what were your biggest takeaways? So let's try and I think what would be informative or instructive for the listeners is a bit of a summary from us. So, so I guess we asked a ton, a ton of questions and we did go very deep. Um, but if you zoom back out, you know, a lot of what we were talking about was what are the, the kind of, um, what's the difference between the adaptations, the metabolic adaptations that occur with different intensities of exercise, right? And just to, to kind of um, spell that out, we're talking about you know, jumping on a, a bike and sort of cycling at uh, a kind of power output where you're a bit puffy, you can perhaps still have a conversation, but you know that you're sort of working. That's like a moderate intensity of exercise. Um, so think of that as just like, more of your steady state continuous exercise, something you might do for 45 minutes or an hour mm -hmm. versus high intensity training where you're actually getting your heart rate up to sort of 90% of its max, you know, no longer is it comfortable to have a conversation. You're working really, really hard, but for a much shorter duration. Mm -hmm. And what we were trying to better understand was what are the differences between these two in terms of what's happening at a cellular level level yeah and then as a result how might this influence a program for someone yeah the question that we really wanted to answer was when you do these different modes of exercise at different intensities as you just mentioned not only what is the energy system or the cellular mechanism that's happening but what is the adaptation what's mm -hmm. the end outcome how does the body adapt to that stimulus and is it different between the two uh, I mean, we, we've, you and I have been listening to episodes on other podcasts and doing some reading and diving into some papers on this, these sorts of things going into it. What makes me feel a lot better about uh, what we've been doing is that he, he made it a lot clearer that we have been on the right track with, with our thought process, but he just, he, he really gave us that extra layer of, of right. detail. But essentially the takeaway is when you are exercising at, We'll call it zone two training, which is very popular in, in the endurance community. Actually, funny story. This morning I went to, I did a boxing class at a, at a new gym, Bondo Boxing Club. And I was talking to one of the pros and I said to him, because boxers are notoriously unbelievably fit. They have some of the highest VO2s in sport. Um, and I said to the guy, what do you, what sort of training do you do? Like strength and conditioning, what sort of cardio? And he says, they have a focus on long run. And I'm like, oh, what, what kind of, like, how hard are the run? And he's like, long enough that, you know, like 10, say a 10K, it's quite long, but we can like talk and it's comfortable and it's pretty easy. And I'm like, mate, he's just, they just train in zone two, zone two when they do their long cardio. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And I think in martial arts, it's just so common. Like some of the best fighters ever are known for just going on the long runs, doing it every week. So let me just double click on that before yeah. you keep going. Um, because I thought that you, you could improve your VO2 max more through high intensity exercise than through moderate intensity zone two. And you, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Okay. But what... That's not to say that moderate intensity doesn't affect VO2. Right. The magnitude of effect from high intensity interval training for VO2 max is better. However... By building a really good aerobic base by spending time at moderate intensities for continuous periods, mm -hmm. so like say 45, 60 minutes straight, so maybe it's that 10K run, right? You head, you head off on a run, you stay at a heart rate that is high enough that obviously it's, you know, there's a demand by the muscles for oxygen, the heart's pumping, but it's not so high that you can't talk and that you're in like a lot of pain. So your RPE is like only about three or four, let's say, right. out of 10. Um, by doing that, and this is what Rooney helped us un understand, when you're running at that intensity, the metabolic machinery that's responsible for actually giving you that energy, right, is in the mitochondria, in the muscles. We've got these powerhouses mm -hmm. called mitochondria. They are burning fat in the presence of oxygen, right, which is a slow burning fuel, which can allow you to maintain that intensity for a fairly long duration. Right. Right. 
Whilst the flip side of the coin is high intensity interval training, which is a totally different energy system. So this energy system is glycolytic, meaning that it uses glucose as a fuel. It's glucose. Mostly coin. glucose. Mostly. There's a blend. There is a blend, but predominantly glucose. So you would think of a boxer, you think, well, 12 three-minute rounds at pretty high intensities, depending on the, the fight, mm -hmm. but I mean, most of the time it's pretty high intensity. Why would they want to go on a 60-minute slow run if the energy, you think that the energy system they're using throughout the fight is mainly fast twitch muscle, fast contractions, glycolytic, we need ATP now, fast. Well, the reason why is because when you build that aerobic base, it helps you at those higher intensities. So you can actually then perform mm -hmm. your HIIT training to a higher level because you've built this strong aerobic base to begin with, right? Whilst if you have a very poor aerobic base, you're going to sort of get to that gassed out point a lot quicker mm -hmm. when you do your high intensity interval training. But the reverse is not necessarily true. So if you only did HIIT training, let's say a boxer, all they ever did was 12 three-minute rounds and that was it. That is not improving their aerobic base to the same degree as if they had that moderate intensity continuous training. So, so splitting the body and understanding the energy systems is actually really crucial for programming uh, when it comes to, I'd say everyone. Right. Like, you don't have to be an athlete to do this stuff. Like it seems very high level. And, and even VO2 max, right? Someone might be listening and thinking, well, why do I care about my VO2 max? Right. But VO2 max is very strongly correlated with reduced risk of dying from cardiovascular disease and reduced all-cause mortality. Yeah. Um, and essentially, VO2 max is a, uh, uh, the marker used to kind of assess cardiorespiratory fitness, right? So, That's right. So um, the amount of oxygen in milliliters mm -hmm. that you're using on, on a per kilogram basis per minute, right? That's it, yeah. So the more oxygen that you can use, the, the higher your cardiorespiratory fitness is. Exactly. Right? So HIIT training will be your sort of the best bang for buck for, for, for getting your VO2 higher, although moderate will still do it. Um, but then if you only did HIIT, you're not going to improve your aerobic base fitness as much as if you did the moderate stuff too. So the real takeaway, and um, I mean, again, I encourage people to listen to that episode, maybe even twice because it's pretty deep. But the takeaway is that we have so many tools in our training toolkit. And I think a lot of us don't understand why we need to use all of them. Uh, or even how to program in a smart way that allows us to do it for, for long mm -hmm. periods of time and adapt to the stimulus. Uh, but in a nutshell, we've got you know resistance training, high intensity interval training, moderate intensity continuous training. For me, those are like the three, sort of like the big three. And then of course, you've got your mobility, your yoga, those kinds of things, and just general physical activity and incidental exercise, like long walks. But I think we need to be thinking about like, we've got this cardiovascular training, which is going to benefit the most important muscle in the body, our heart. We've got resistance training, which is going to build muscle tissue, skeletal tissue, build strong bones, bone mineral density. How we incorporate the two together over a week is really important. Mm -hmm. And the intensities of our cardio is also really, really mm -hmm. important. And Rooney did a really good job of explaining some of the like key, I guess, metabolites that are the, that are the triggers or the signals for the body to adapt, which... I don't want to try even go into it now because some of the terms are just too mm -hmm. difficult. So we'll let, we'll let Rooney explain in that episode. But um, one of the main ones that he spoke about was high intensity increases AMP, which acts as a signal for mitochondrial biogenesis. Now, I, I, I knew that, that high intensity interval training was a good stimulus for mitochondrial proliferation or biogenesis, but I didn't know why. Right. And I think that that's where as an exercise physiologist, I'd sort of done my job. Like my, my job, job was to just know that fact right. so that when it comes to programming, if someone's like, I really want to improve my VO2 or, or uh, essentially create more mitochondria, well, I'm like, okay, well, here's the tool. Use this one. But I didn't know why mm -hmm. from a biochemical point of view. I had no idea. Uh, so it was really interesting to hear that from him. Right. Um, and it, it will help me with my programming. Not the just other thing that I think is important in terms of talking about whether moderate intensity continuous exercise can improve VO2. From my reading, the, the less aerobically fit you are, so if you're someone that has metabolic syndrome, is not doing any type of cardiovascular um, exercise at all, the greater VO2 improvement you could get from moderate intensity. And then as you become a more fit and fit right. athlete, then 
it might be that hit's going to be what's going to help you continue to, to build on that. Yeah, that's a good point. So you, you sort of squeeze most of the sponge dry with that sort of lower, mm. moderate intensity stuff. And then when you want to like get those last few drops out, that's where you maybe add in that hit training uh, where you're going to get that, obviously, that, those central benefits to mm-hmm. the heart, to the, the lungs. And, and again, another interesting takeaway was, was the difference between these central adaptations and peripheral mm-hmm. adaptations where these lower intensity, long duration, continuous steady state exercises can help you with that peripheral, like, like the mitochondria, those powerhouses, those machines. You can, we can get them to function better, more efficiently, whilst if you want to create more machines, we've got to hit those, those you've got to redline that, that hit training, mm-hmm. get to that dark place and really push yourself. Perhaps the most interesting thing that came out of this was afterwards when you were looking through some studies and we found what the minimal effective dose seems to be for HIT. Right. This is really important, right? Yeah. But in terms of, because people are probably thinking, well, you know, what does this mean for my weekly program? So share yeah. some information on that. Well, I've got to be honest. From what I've read in most of the literature, there's, there's a very standardized HIT training protocol that you'll see in the studies. A lot of authors have used the same studies. Four by four minute intervals. But within that four minute interval, so let's say within the four minute interval or the on time, you're training at above 85% of your, your max heart rate, up to 90, 95, right. even. For four minutes straight. For four and minutes. And then you have like a three minute then rest. Yeah, three minute like. rest and you right. repeat that four times. Yeah. So the whole thing takes about 40 minutes yeah, by the time you get through it's, it's usually sub, th- yeah, warm up, cool down with three minute rest between everything. It's like 35 minutes, let's yeah. say. Okay. So, you see that a lot in the studies and also during that four minutes, it's not necessarily four minutes straight of like as hard as you can. Some studies do a 30 on 30 off for four minutes, right. rest for three minutes, go again, 30 on 30 off But is the four. idea for your average heart rate during that four minutes should be at 85%. Above 85, yes. Above 85. Through it. So even in the 30 seconds rest, if you're coming down to 50% of your max heart rate, you're not okay. really so doing So let me ask training. you a question while we're going through this. Yeah. Because often I think something like F45 is conflated with HIIT training. But HIT training in the evidence, like in the, in the studies, is this protocol you're talking about, which is 85% of your max heart rate. Mm-hmm. And that's th- those are the studies that are then looking at, well, how does this type of training affect certain outcomes? So could we say that something like F45, is that equivalent to that type of training? Great question. I would say it depends on the individual, how hard they push themselves in those sessions. Right. If you are coasting through your set of 45 seconds, let's say you're doing thrusters or burpees or whatever, those actually, those two exercises are pretty hard to coast through. But like, I, I haven't done F45, so I don't know the exact exercises they do, but I'm sure there's a way for you to do it. It's a little easy, right? If you're doing F45 hard, as hard as possible, and pushing yourself in those 45 seconds, I think it's a 45 on 15 off. Sorry for all the F45s out there if I've messed that up, but let's just say it is for the sake of this. You can do that as a form of hit. I bet you there are people who have a wearable device and they look at their heart rate and it's actually 85. So if you look at it and your heart rate, that's yeah. going to be the indicator, right? Yeah, if, you're if your heart rate's 85%. above 85 for that time. But here's, here's the big caveat. The whole thing about this kind of training is there's an intensity duration trade-off. The reason hit training is so short by duration is because it's so hard. I don't think anyone could keep their heart rate above 90% for 45 minutes straight. I just don't, I just do not think that that is possible, especially long-term. Maybe if you do the hardest workout of your life, you can do it. But the whole point about HIIT is it's actually short and sharp because it's so difficult, you can't do it for long periods of time. So I, my, my guess would be most people aren't doing it as to the same degree of HIIT that you would see in the literature in terms of their heart rate above 85 the whole time. Yeah. That's my guess. I don't know a lot about that, Could be wrong. that training. I know they have different programs. So yeah. they might have some that are more focused on that and then they have some that are more focused on strength. But Yeah. I think it is fair to call it high-intensity interval training. I think the heart rate definitely is significantly higher than most other forms of training. And like I said, if you really push yourself, yeah, I mean, it can hurt. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it. I guess the important thing that I was trying to get to is that what we're going to talk about and what the studies have shown, this is based off a protocol that is a little bit different. Yeah, very different. Um, but yeah, so most protocols are those four by fours. But you found a, a study comparing a multiple set protocol, meaning yep. 
four minute intervals multiple times in one workout. I did three in a workout. Three, three four minute intervals in that one workout compared to just one four minute interval. And they did that three times a week, both, both groups. And the results were very similar after, mm-hmm. I think it was a 12 week study from memory. Right. 12 weeks the later. The VO2 max results yes, were very similar. Yes. And then there was some slightly better improvements in terms of things like cholesterol, some of the metabolic markers yes. with those that did the, the higher volume hit, which was three by four minute hit sessions three times a week. Yes. But the VO2, so the measure of cardiorespiratory fitness was really similar. Very close. Yeah. Yeah. It was 10 versus 13% increase in VO2 after 12 weeks between the group who did it once, yeah. uh, one interval per session versus mm-hmm. three intervals per session. So for people out there who are thinking, well, how much hit do you need to do? Well, it seems like a possible minimum effective dose could be one hard four minute interval where you really do get your heart rate above 85 and you hold it there right. for four minutes. That is, that's a minimum dose that could get you a 10% improvement in VO2 after 12 mm-hmm. weeks. And that VO2 improvement, just to quantify that, because we looked at another paper, what does that actually look like in terms of say, if, if you commit to doing uh, one four minute bout of hit three times a week, right? And you get that 10% improvement. I think it was five milliliters per kilogram per minute. That was the VO2 improvement, like in an absolute amount. Yep. And when we looked at that, um, based on epidemiology, so looking at a whole big population of people and where their VO2 max is and their risk of getting heart disease or dying, I should say, from cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality, that improvement in VO2 max could be a 30% re- risk reduction. Mm. You could reduce your risk, relative risk, compared to yourself before you change your VO2 mm. by 30% your cardiovascular mortality risk and all-cause mortality, right? And that's just from doing committing to doing three four-minute hit sessions over a week. For 12 weeks. For 12 weeks, right? That's impressive. And so we don't know what is the benefit of added benefit of continuing on with that. Right. Um, I would say because of some of those benefits for like blood pressure and some of the, uh, some of the lipids mm-hmm. that the higher frequency hit group got, mm. who were doing three four-minute um, hit sessions three times a week. Yep. It may be depending on your baseline. Obviously, it comes down to adherence. So what can you fit in? But if you're someone with um, dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, then that might be more, more of a reason to try and get a few of these extra sessions in over yeah. and above that minimum dose. Absolutely. And I think it's also it's nice to know that you, you can start at a minimum dose and work your way up. You can just add a second interval each session. So maybe you start off, you do for, for the next four weeks, you know, you do that four minute bout three times a week, you do that for four weeks. And then for the next four weeks after that, add another one, do two. Mm. And then the next four weeks, add a third, do three. You know, and just increase the volume over time. And then eventually maybe you want to do four by four minutes or whatever. Some people like to do four minutes straight. So in that four minute interval, you just hold a wattage and go as hard as you can for four minutes. Let's just break this down. I walk into a gym. Let's say we're going to do this on a bike, Mm -hmm. right? I've decided I'm listening to Drew and Simon. I want to do a four minute hit session. There's a bike in front of me. What do I do? Okay. So warm up. You're going to jump on the bike. You're going to do five minutes at about 50 to 60% of your max heart rate. Mm -hmm. So you need to be monitoring your heart rate. It does help. You don't need to, but it it definitely does help. Okay. Um, I think it is important. So without going too deep into this, because this could be a six hour pod on its own, you need to know how to calculate your max heart rate. Most devices like a Whoop or a Fitbit will have that built in. Like there's an algorithm that figures out for you based on you've been wearing Mm -hmm. your thing for a while. It knows how old you are, whatever. It'll tell you what your max heart rate is. The most simple um, estimation or calculation is 220 minus your age. There's way better ones out there now, but- We'll come back and do a whole episode on this. Yeah. So roughly know your max heart rate. Using that number, do you know what 90% or 85% of your max heart rate is? Let's say 85, let's say the lower limit. 85% of your max heart rate. Right. The hit zone is 85 and above. So it can go up to 100. Some people can push it that hard. Jump on a bike for five minutes, warm up. When you feel ready and comfortable, we can start the first interval where you're going to have, you need a time. So most bikes will have a computer where you can actually see the time and the clock ticking. 
you're going to choose what protocol you're going to do. Are you doing 30 on 30 off? Are you doing a 40 on 20 off? What interval can you do and that you're comfortable with? And the, the fun thing about this is you can change this up week to week. This is part of the variety because right. it can seem so boring. But actually, if you just play with those intervals, you could do eight seconds on, 12 off or whatever. Like you literally can choose But what anything. you're trying to do is make sure that throughout that whole four minute block, no matter what on off period you choose with yeah. that, you're going for four minutes and that heart rate you want to be at 85% or higher. Correct. And then it'll fluctuate. Like even in, say, say you do 30 on 30 off. It's going to drop. It's going to come off. down a little bit, right? But the point is those 30 seconds should be so hard that the 30 seconds recovery is not enough to get you below your 85%. Right? It's still very difficult. You need those 30 seconds. And they're going to feel like they go by like mm -hmm. that. Right? It's the quickest 30 seconds of your life. So what kind of bike is ideal for doing this? So you gym? want a bike that you can change resistance on? Um, one that you push the up buttons or one nah, that you're twisting? I think you're a twisting. knob. Yeah, when you you're, twist a knob is probably the best. Right. Um, and you want to pick a resistance that's not too hard that you're like grinding in gear seven. Right? So if everyone's been on a bike before with gears, Gear one, obviously, you can spin your wheels nice and easy. Your pedals just fly. It feels like there's not much resistance. Gear six and seven, you're grinding. You don't want to be grinding. We want the, the cadence or the RPM to be, I like to, I like to do mine at 90 to 100 revolutions per minute. Okay, so 90 to 100 RPM. Um, if you're doing it at, say, 60 RPM on a really high gear, you're, you're stuck in the mud. You're grinding. You're not going to, I don't think, you're not going to be able to contract your muscles fast enough and enough times per minute to actually get your heart rate as high as you want to be getting it to. So mm. it's picking the right resistance, knowing the RPM, hit those four minutes, keep your heart rate above 85%. Then you've got three minutes of rest. Now in these three minutes of rest, don't do nothing. This is what people do is they stop. Mm -hmm. You've just built up so much lactic acid that if you stop, it'll pull in your legs and you, the fatigue will be immense. You probably won't be able to do a repeat bout. Huh. Spin nice and light at 50%. Just keep the legs moving. This will clear some of that lactic acid so your muscles won't feel like they've got lead in them, right? And then you go again and you do the same thing again. Maybe you want to do two, three, or four mm -hmm. times. Have a five-minute cool down and then… Right. But what we're coming back to what we were saying at the beginning, that study we were looking at that found a, an improvement in VO2 max in healthy adults of five uh, milliliters per kilogram per minute, mm -hmm. which as I said, it quite could equate to about a 30% reduction in risk of all cause mortality. That was one four minute session. Right. Right. So I just want to really put an exclamation mark yeah. on that. So if someone's listening and doesn't do any of this and thinks I want to just get on and experience it, here's the challenge. Three times a week, jump on and do what Drew just said, just for one round. Yes. So do your warm up, choose your if it's 30 on, 30 off, or 40 on, 20 off, whatever it is. And you're going to do four minutes of high intensity work. Your heart rate should be at 85%, your max heart rate or higher. Do that three times a week. Yeah. That's Start there. Pretty simple. That's the most simple way to do it. In the study that we saw, they actually did the four minute bout as one block. There, was, there was no on off. So it was basically, you're going to hold 90 to 100 RPM. This is the resistance. Get your heart rate to 85 and hold it. Mm. Just keep that. Go as hard as you can. If you get to the point where your legs are starting to like fatigue so much, dial the resistance back a little bit so you can keep that cadence up. As long as your heart rate stays above 85, that doesn't matter, right? So that was interesting that they just did one four minute go, which from practice, like in a practical scenario, you could just add that on to the end of your moderate intensity cardio. Mm -hmm. Let's say you, you do a 45 minutes on the bike at a you know nice easy pace where you can talk to the person next to you enough that you're still breathing and it's, you know, it's not like a walk in the park. But if right at the end, you've done your 45 minutes, you just go four minutes as hard as you can. Get your heart yeah. rate above 85. That could be a form of hit mm. that will actually That's have That's tough doing four out. minutes nonstop. But also I find with, say, 30 on, 30 off, that I drop below 85% in the 30 off. Yeah, I was thinking about it. For someone like you, I reckon, because everyone's different, but if you know that the 30 on, 30 off is not allowing you to reach that target heart rate, you might do better with a 45, 15. Yeah. Just increase the work right. interval, change the work to rest ratio, or maybe it's even like a 60 on 30 off, mm -hmm. two to one ratio. But if it's a one to one ratio and you feel like you are dropping down, then it's not serving you. Either you're not pushing hard enough in those 30 seconds, mm -hmm. but I've seen you, I think you've got the push. So I think maybe you just need to increase that interval mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, or it's too light, the resistance. Right. So I'd like to look at their out. methodology on the four minute, because I feel like it would also take you a while to ramp up to 85%. 
at the yes. beginning. Yes, yeah. It's not like you just start pedaling and no, you're at 85. It, yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll dig into that, but yeah. we can perhaps summarize this at some stage um, for folks in a, in a written form or something. There's probably some people thinking, uh, and I mentioned metabolic syndrome uh, before, uh, or metabolic health and, and some of these um, changes that, that some studies have seen with lipids and, and the high blood pressure, et cetera. A uh, question people might be thinking is, is this safe for someone with cardiovascular disease? Mm. Um, and I think there are some different opinions and ideas out there. So yeah. firstly, I'd say if you have a cardiologist, they know your condition best, uh, your unique sort of variety of cardiovascular disease, your history, whether you've had surgery, what medications you're on, all of that sort of stuff. Mm. But I will say I, uh, I went uh, to PubMed and, and, and also emailed a few people cardiologists, which I did get some mixed results on. Mm. So there were some cardiologists that did say that they actually recommend steering away from high intensity interval training. If someone has cardiovascular disease, there were others who said, no, it's, it's, there's evidence showing that it's actually safe. Yeah. Um, and what I found was a paper that was published in 2018 in the journal of American, uh, heart association. This was published by the American heart association and it's called High Intensity Interval Training for Patients with Cardiovascular Disease. Is it safe? A systematic review. And in this systematic review, they looked at 23 controlled trials. So this was mm -hmm. subjects, over a thousand subjects with cardiovascular disease. That number might not seem like a whole lot, but remember, this is not a population study. These are controlled trials. Um, so you're still getting a, a sort of look at quite a few people going through HIT who have cardiovascular disease. And their kind of main takeaway in this paper was that high intensity interval training appears to be relatively safe to conduct in patients with cardiovascular disease, including coronary artery disease and heart failure within tertiary care cardiac rehabilitation settings. Um, so it appears, you know, the American Heart Association at least are saying that it's a safe uh, form of exercise for people with cardiovascular disease. I still think it's a good idea if you have it to, to kind of run it past your, your cardiologist or uh, physician, but I will link to that paper as well, so folks can can read that. Um, so that's that's hit. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should uh, think about a, a weekly program. So I think you've definitely created the case there for implementing some some hit. Um, well, there we go. To the AFL. That's the AFL. <laughs> the, uh, Speaking of AFL, the American folks. Oh god. Without getting too much off topic, should we get off topic here? Let's, Let's get off just for five minutes. How about my team, dude? That comeback, that was the best after the siren goal I've ever seen. Never seen anything like Never it. Never seen anything like it. Jamie Elliott. No one oh, knows what we're ice, talking about. Ice but. in his veins. <laughs> Mate, that was wow. incredible. Do you want to paint the picture for people? Like people, most of your audience are probably American. They're like, what? AFL? What well, that? actually everyone, here's a project. Forget the hit for the week. Um, <laughs> you, have, you have a new challenge. Um, no, I want, you, I, I want you to do hit. That's for you. But for me... I want you to go to YouTube and I want you to search Jamie Elliott. Yeah. That's J A M I E Elliott. Uh, kick after the siren, and you will see a uh, team that uh, I passionately support. Understatement. Although most people on here probably they don't see that side of my life. So um, you know, I've grown up. Uh, my dad went for Collingwood. I was going to football games. Um, you know, as early as I can remember when we would come back and visit Australia as a little kid. Uh, we go to those games, so I have a lot of fond memories. And um, anyway, watch that game, watch that kick after the siren, um, and just to 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 kind of create um, the the set the stage here. Collingwood, my team, last year they were they were really struggling. New coach came in this year. People were thinking, you know, they're not going to be that great. They've won nine games in a row. Just, let's be, let's be honest. Yeah, right. I know it's actually, we're speaking of cardiovascular disease. I'm not sure that um, the, the, the supporters have loved the tight finishes and it's yeah. probably been a bit stressful on the hearts out there <laughs> of calling with supporters, but they have been winning nonetheless. So uh, if you want to get a bit of a glimpse as to what AFL football is all about, um, watch the last two minutes of that and you'll, you'll find that on YouTube. Just search Jamie Elliott goal after the siren. It was amazing. Anyway, um, Let's uh, let's come back to a program. So I think you created the case for the HIT training. 
um, you know, as Rooney said, that high intensity training is going to be what promotes mitochondrial by Genesis. We know that it improves VO2 max. We just spoke about the benefits of that. We also know that that's what, uh, relative to say moderate intensity cardio, um, continuous training, the high intensity training is what causes greater adaptation centrally. So mm -hmm. heart and arteries and, um, um, you know, all of these other aspects of cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, but if we're thinking about a program and we're thinking about also having some moderate intensity continuous training, um, let's take two scenarios. Mm -hmm. So let's just take the first scenario is someone um, listening can, can put aside 45 minutes of training a day for five days a week. That's their allocation to exercise. Yeah. I kind of want to understand, okay, if we think about high intensity, which we've just spoken about, the duration of that is actually not that long mm -hmm. um, to, to get that minimum effective volume. If we think about the more mo moderate intensity continuous training, which does take up quite a bit of time, and then you think about strength training, which we haven't even got to, a yeah. whole other episode. Yeah. But if we think about these kind of three main categories – and someone has 45 minutes per day for five days a week. They have two days off where they don't train. What does their program look like? So going off the guidelines of minutes per week and modalities of training, it's, it's recommended 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardio per week. Right. 2.5 hours. Two and a half hours a week. So there are many ways that you can incorporate that into your training. The, the program that I would see fitting most people, which again, I'd say this is the minimum effective dose. And I know that some people are like, well, I don't even have 45 minutes, five days a week. This is ideal. So this is for people who really can afford to, to spend, let's say during the week, all of your weekdays, you're going to find 45 minutes to work out. If you can dedicate two of those days to resistance training, you're going to get all the benefits of improving your muscle strength, which helps lower the risk of falling as you age, improve your bone mineral density. And the minimum effective dose for resistance training, if you actually want to grow bigger, is the frequency is train each muscle group twice a week. So that is sort of the sweet spot right there. So what you would do is you would have two full body workouts per week and you can space them out. You have a day or two of rest between those, right? So twice a week, full body. Can I ask you a question on those? Sure, yeah. So you've got 45 minutes to do a full body workout. Yeah. My understanding is that you want to ideally be getting sort of 10 sets in a week mm -hmm. for most muscle groups as a minimum amount of sets. Would that be? Yeah, spot on. That'd be right. Mm -hmm. So when you're creating that full body workout, yeah, this is probably a whole nother episode, but just in, in sort of high level, what, what I'm kind of hearing from you is you would, you would create that, that in a way so that you would be doing sort of five sets of a given body part in one of those sessions yeah. and then the, another five sets of that same body part in the next session, which would equate to 10 sets for the week. Right. You are correct in that the sort of the minimum dose would be about 10 sets per muscle group per week, but that's for hypertrophy. If that's talking, we're talking people who really want to grow bigger muscles. This for me is more of like the baseline healthy for, for the health for an individual that wants to be healthy and doesn't actually care about really optimizing hypertrophy mm. right because if you're trying to fit 10 sets per week per muscle group across two workouts and you're doing full body two times a week is not enough to distribute right. that that and 45 volume. minutes is not going to be long right so the frequency would have to increase you'd have to do full body maybe four or five times a week to get enough volume per mm. body part so that you get your 10 Unless sets. you work out for 90 minutes. Correct. And then you're going to have fatigue. So this is someone like, uh, sorry, mom, but this is for you. Like, <laughs> Okay, but, but then let me, let me play devil's advocate here. Yeah. So if we're focusing mostly on strength, what sort of rep range are we talking about here? Is strength a goal for this person? Because I, I would say we stick to moderate repetitions. Mm -hmm. Well, the moderate range typically is 6 to 12. Right. So the strength range we would say 6 reps and below. I think for, the, for most people, it's unnecessary. Six to 12 is the most time efficient, bang for your buck. You're going to get the stimulus. You're going to get low enough reps that you're developing that neural strength pathway, high enough that you get a metabolic stress from mm -hmm. the 12 reps. But you're not doing so many reps that from like, for example, 15 to 30. 
That would be like a high rep range. So six to 12. Six to 12 reps. But something that would be really important would be the RPE. Yes. So per exercise, we want to be getting at least three reps shy of failure, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're doing a set of 12 uh, squats, but you could have got 20 reps, it's not heavy enough. You're not optimizing the stimulus. So pick a weight or a load that allows you to get within three reps of that fail point where your technique sort of right. goes. That's a fair point to terminate the set. So what I would say is you're probably only going to need to do two sets per exercise. We're going to do an exercise for your upper body pushing in both the vertical and horizontal plane, upper body pulling, vertical and horizontal. Then we've got a squat pattern and a hinge pattern. Right. So just to really reinforce that so that people are getting the best bang for their buck. Because if you've, if you've got short time, the way I see it is when you go and work out, you want to be getting the, as much results as you can, right? Right. You know, wring every bit of water out of that towel in that session. Exactly. Um, and so <laughs> when, when you say three reps left, and we covered this on a previous episode, yeah. but basically when you decide that you're finishing that set, you need to be, it's going to feel hard. Oh, yeah. Right. So ha- give, give, give me an idea as to what three reps left actually feels like. So if someone that hasn't trained that much is yeah. kind of thinking, okay, I just, I'd like to some indications as to whether I'm actually taking a set to that point. Okay. So three reps short of failure is equivalent to an RPE of seven out of 10. Okay. If 10 out of 10 is I cannot do another repetition. I'm done. Right. Even if I try as hard as I can with a spotter, with seven people motivating me, screaming in my face and a gun to my head, I can't move this weight. That's a 10 out of 10. Seven out of 10 is I can feel a significant burn. My velocity of repetition has slowed down. I'm starting to grind a little bit. So it doesn't look like my first rep. And I want to stop, but I know I could probably do a few more. Mm-hmm. That's, that's okay. probably where you want to So be. what would happen if you go into the gym and you still do your 45 minute workout, but you finish everything on an RPA of five. So very mild burn, not, not much. And you had quite, quite a lot of reps. Like you're still going to get some benefit. Yes, you, you definitely will. Uh, depending on your rep range, of course. Um, but yes, you will get benefit at five reps in reserve. Are you optimizing it? No. And if you really want to get, you know, better and better and progressively overload, over time, you're going to have to get closer and closer to that zero reps in reserve. So essentially, like if you're programming intelligently, you'll increase your volume over time, but you'll also have workouts where you do go to, to failure. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you do, if you train in failure all the time, you're just going to burn out over time. We, we spoke about it on, on a previous mm-hmm. study that we brought up on an episode before, chronic failure training, yeah. what it does to the body. But essentially, we're going in twice a week, full body workouts, and we, the, the workout density here is important. So- I would, I would structure this. It's called agonist antagonist supersets, which is just a fancy way of saying you're going to pair together exercises that are opposing muscle groups. So like pushing and pulling muscles. When the pushing muscles are resting, the pulling muscles can work. So that allows you to be very time efficient. You Get more squeeze volume more in. in that 45 minutes. Correct. Like if you just did everything and rested for one to two minute per exercise, well, you're missing out on that one minute of rest where you could be doing muscles that are fresh and you're not going to tax mm-hmm. the muscles that you just worked. So you're gonna, we're going to pair them up in supersets, push, pull, push, pull, maybe legs core, and we're going to just crank out 45 minutes straight, couple exercises, uh, sorry, a couple sets per exercise. We're going to do that twice a week. On your other days, you're going to do cardio, right? So we've done two days of resistance, three days of cardio. Here, we're going to combine the moderate intensity and the hit training into the one session, but we're going to do our moderate intensity training first for, for let's say you've got the 45 minutes, right? 40 minutes on the bike. And for your last five minutes, four minutes, whatever you want, you're going to do that hit bout that we just spoke about. So 40 minutes at moderate, that's at a heart rate that we've also predetermined based off the calculations. At the end of that 40 minutes, it's time to crank up the resistance a bit, increase that RPM if you have to, and try to get the heart rate over 85%, hold that for four minutes. Mm -hmm. You can do that three times a week. So we've got, you can just alternating days, you know, so resistance, cardio, resistance, cardio. So you kind of just glossed over the calculation for moderate. Did I? Sorry. Right. But I, I, I know we did a presentation on that at the retreat. Yeah. So um, 
it, it's it's a hard one to kind of explain in audio. It's almost easier for people to read. Just come to the retreat in October <laughs> and we'll give you a visual no, workshop. Well, that is a good way for all of this to kind of um, be consolidated. But um, I think what we might do to have, so it can be a bit easier, we can we can have something in the show notes or at some point we'll put together a couple scenarios and make it as a resource. Yeah. Um, but for now, just to summarize that, you're saying, so someone has 45 minutes available for five days a week. They are looking for wanting to, to create an exercise program that is for general health and well-being, longevity. Um, so we're going to be working different energy systems and also um, training different parts of the body. So there'll be uh, these resistance training, two resistance training sessions a week, which both of them are full body yep. resistance um, training sessions that go for 45 minutes uh, each. Then on top of that, you have three days where you do a moderate intens- intensity continuous training. So that could be sitting on the on a bike for 40 minutes, um, heart rate to, to sort of um, determine or heart rate to kind of aim for is going to be roughly 60, 70, 70% of your max heart rate, but we'll provide more accurate calculations for that. Um, yeah, 65, 75, uh, I would say is right. going to be the sweet spot there. Okay. So that will see you probably land in zone two. Um, but the other thing that someone could think about there is can they hold a conversation? Yep. Right. So that, we call that the talk test. Right. And you actually use that in exercise physiology a lot in like cardiac rehab wards. Right. You, you, you want, we use that as an intensity regulator. Right. So in that, in that continuous 40 minute of on the bike, you should have a bit of a sweat. You're a bit puffy. Yep. You can have a conversation. It's not like you're just sitting like down this. and having a tea, no. but you could still have one. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of each of those, you're going to do a four minute hit. And if you're really geeky, you can do what we did and get a lactate meter, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother episode. It too far. And, um, I think that might complicate it for this, yeah. for this avatar anyway. Yeah, right? absolutely. I think that that's, that's something maybe more for someone who's optimizing for athletes. Mind you, we did talk about it with Rooney, so you can check that right. out as well. Um, but that's scenario one. Yep. Now, what about someone who has a little bit more time? So they have an hour a day and they only take one day off a week. So it's, it's still pretty close to the same time as the first one. It's a little bit bigger. I'm interested if that changes things. Uh, it's a little bit longer. I mean, um, I'm interested if that changes things in, in terms of programming for this person. Yeah, I think that we now have an extra day to do a third resistance training workout. Um, I've always liked that two to three times a week for resistance training as a, as a sweet spot. Um, and th- there have been position statements saying that two to three times a week is, mm-hmm. is recommended where you're going to get like a lot of benefits whilst four or five times a week may not necessarily take you that much further unless you're like a bodybuilder with specific goals. But for the general population who want to be strong, build some muscle, improve their bone mineral density, two to three times a week in the gym is going to do just fine. Um, and again, I would do these as full body workouts. There are other splits you can do. You can do upper lower splits, but again, you need more frequency for those. So if you're doing an upper lower split, you'd need for probably four days in the gym would be the optimal frequency because we want to hit upper body mm-hmm. twice a week and lower body twice a week. But here we've only got three days. Let's go full body again. The exact same thing with a day off in between. Right. When I say day off, I'm not saying a day of complete rest, but we can do the cardio on those days again. So we, we'll have those three moderate intensity uh, continuous training days where we're in the zone two on a bike or whatever mode you want to do it on. Or if you don't mind training a certain body part on a different day of the week each week. Right. You could turn that into an eight-day week. Exactly. Right. Yeah. We talk about this in seven days, but you could, it's called asynchronous training where instead of just starting every uh, week on that Monday workout, it'll look different each week. If you do it in eight days. If you take an eight-day block, that could be push, pull, legs. Correct. Yeah. Push, pull, legs, upper, lower, full body, or you could do a total bro split where you just pick a muscle group and, and hit it in one go. But Okay. I, st- I do think if, if we're just simplifying it for minimum dose, three resistance trainings a week, a full body, three cardios of moderate intensity, at the end of those zone twos, you can throw on that, that four-minute interval of hit at the end. But we've also now got another opportunity to do a hit day where, th- where there's a specific day that we're going to absolutely dedicate 
to HIIT training where we can get those four four-minute intervals, right? So you can add in that extra day if you want. You can swap out, say, one of the moderates. Okay, and got put, you. And put in a dedicated four-by-four-minute interval HIIT day where you're, you're sort of essentially right. giving that 35, 40 minutes of HIIT training. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's so many different options and ways to do it, but just think about the dosing, think about what the guidelines are saying. We've yeah. got those, you know, 150 minutes a week of moderate, mm-hmm. as long as you're hitting that resistance two to three times a week at the intensities we just spoke about and at least taking one or two of your cardio workouts to that high intensity right. interval training zone, then you're covering your total, your bases. The total time that you're, you're spending in, in moderate continuous at that you know, 65, 70% of your max heart rate is going to be much longer than the time you're spent at the 90% heart rate doing HIT training. Exactly right. Intensity, duration, trade-off. If you're able to do HIT for 60 minutes, you're not doing HIT. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. It's meant to be so difficult that four minutes is… Is that where the 80-20 kind of yeah. saying comes from? Yeah. I, again, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine at when I was getting my coffee this morning, who was an ex-pro cyclist. And I said to him, I said, hey, mate, have you heard of zone two training? He's like, hey, zone two, it's all we do. Like, <laughs> he laughed at me. He's like, of course, that's like 80% of our base. So a lot of cyclists who, although in their event, they're not, at, you know, they're not cycling in zone two, they train in zone two, meaning they train at a lower intensity that's easier than, the, than what they would do in their performance. Mm-hmm. Because, and in his words, he goes, yeah, mate, that's how you build your base. Right, so, and when they say build their base, they, that's how you shift your lactate threshold up. Right. So they're talking about aerobic base so that that threshold where you start to produce lactate, which is very fatiguing, mm-hmm. is pushed up. So right. you, you can You can do more it. power yes. for a given amount of lactate. Exactly right. Yeah, perfect way to put it. Um, which is why we got the lactate meter. You can listen to the Rooney episode, but Simon and I, we played around mm. on some bikes with the lactate meter. I feel meter. like we have uh, quite a few episodes to do after this. Yeah. To kind of segment things. You could do a whole episode on lactate testing and lactate thresholds. There could be an entire episode on strength training, an entire episode on hypertrophy. So um, perhaps folks can jump onto YouTube and leave some comments. Let us know what yeah. you would like us to kind of dive into. Cool. Um, okay. All righty. Well, I think that was that was well summarized. I feel like you said everything you wanted to. I can go a lot deeper, but we'll keep it there for now. I think that's enough. Cool. Well, let's... Slide over to the next segment. Okay. What study we? of the week. Study of the week. Okay. You want to kick this off? Hasn't been enough. Right. Science. I'm sick yet. of my own voice. You talk for a bit. Okay. Um, well, I've got one study that uh, won't take me too long to whip through. This is actually hot off the press. Um, it's actually a very long-term study. There's been results published over um, a few different years looking at different things. Really, really interesting. It's looking... This latest study um, was reporting on the effects of resistant starch on the development of cancer. So resistant starch, just to kind of refresh everyone's mind, um, is a type of carbohydrate that is not digested by us, passes through to the large intestine, and is digested by the microbes. And for that reason, resistant starch is considered a prebiotic just like polyphenols, well, most polyphenols are also prebiotic in nature and prebiotic fiber. So if you think about prebiotics, the way I like to think about it is that prebiotics is an umbrella term. And underneath that, you have these three classes, polyphenols, prebiotic fiber, like inulin, and then resistant starch. And some folks may have heard about potatoes. If you cook them and then you cool them, you actually... Uh, increase the amount of resistant starch in them. Mm-hmm. It's a neat little trick. Um, anyway, so this paper, this was a randomized controlled trial uh, back, I think, 1996 it started. And it was looking at almost 1,000 people who had a syndrome called Lynch syndrome. And this is a, a hereditary condition that predisposes you to developing colorectal cancer and a bunch of other types of cancer. Um. So a really interesting group of people to study to see if you give them something, can you reduce their risk of developing this cancer that they are much more likely to develop than the average person. Mm-hmm. And they, they were interested in, there were some hypotheses about resistant starch and the effect that it might have on the development of colorectal cancer. Also aspirin, 
Um, so they tested both of those. They had a, a randomized process, and this was conducted across the world. I think uh, 43 different clinics around the world did this. It was double-blind placebo. Um, and so there was resistant starch, aspirin, or a placebo pill, right? You didn't know which one you were given. Mm-hmm. And you they, they were given these um, you know, supplements, whichever one that they were randomized to, for about a five-year period, okay? And really, really um, well thought out, the researchers decided to follow up those subjects over at least a 10-year period. I believe they're still following um, the ones that are still alive afterwards because it might be that the, the taking resistant starch or aspirin might not have an effect on cancer for many years to come. It might not show in the actual period of the study so itself. So five-year intervention. Five-year intervention. And then 10-year follow-up And then they stopped. After that. They stopped taking it. Right. Right. And then they did a 10-year follow-up, which is what I've got in front of me. So I have a 10-year follow-up looking at um, what happened to these people in terms of their development, risk of developing cancer 10 years later. Mind you, they didn't continue. Right. Remember, they didn't know what they were taking. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like, you know, Drew, you're in the study, you're taking resistant starch, and at the end I tell you, you were taking resistant starch and, you know, off you go and you decide to keep taking it. You didn't know. You were blinded. Yeah. Um, it was in a pill form. You weren't like, I was eating about to say, green can, banana or something. Is it possible that people ate resistant starch unknowingly in their diet? Well, they might, but because they're randomized, you'd expect it's that the, to be evenly distributed, gotcha. right? Yep. So this is a, uh, an exposure to something over and above diet. Got it. And you would expect in a group where you randomize that the the kind of diets are um, similar, right? You, you've controlled for that. Yeah. So um, what's r- just amazingly fascinating is that at this 10-year follow-up period, they found um, that those who were randomized to the resistant starch group had a 60% reduction in cancer incidence. Wow. And right? they started with the same relative risk they, this was just a group of people yeah. with lynch syndrome who were randomized okay. to the three groups wow. right so again the way randomization works is if it's done correctly um that you have an even distribution of people in each group yep. Yep. Um, um you know age bmi any risk other risk factors smoking alcohol consumption all of that right which is one of the benefits of a randomized controlled trial over epidemiology even yep. though you, you can sort of adjust for some of that stuff. Um, So they had this strikingly large reduction. It wasn't actually colorectal cancer. It was the upper digestive tract cancers where they had saw these big reductions in Mm -hmm. in risk. Um, And there there are kind of um, some proposed mechanisms um, that maybe can help explain it. I think the researchers... Said they said here we think that resistant starch may reduce cancer development by changing the bacterial metabolism of bile acids, and to reduce those types of bile acids that can damage our DNA and eventually cause cancer. However, this needs further research. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is just another really uh, sort of big tick for a, a, a plant-rich, whole plant food-based diet where you know. Foods that are rich in resistant starch are things like oats and barley, all of your legumes, um, rice, potatoes. As I said, particularly if you take rice or potatoes and you cook them and then let them cool, you have increasing amount of resistant starch um, in them. And there's a, a name for that process. I think it's um, starch re- retrogradation, okay. I think is, is what it's called. I can put a link to one of the papers in there, but I looked up one of the papers because I was interested. Well, if you cool the potato and then you cook it again. Does it get more resistant starch? Or, or does it go back? Well, what if it cools twice? It doesn't. Um, well, I'm not sure, but that's a good question. If you cook it again and then yeah. let it cool. I didn't see a paper that looked at that, but I did look at one that, that cooked it, cooled it, and then looked at the amount of resistant starch in it, cooked it again, and if you, because if you wanted to heat your food and yeah, eat it, yeah. um, and it didn't change it, you, you still, you still potato, had yeah. the increased okay. am- amount, um, which is, you know, really, really interesting. Essentially what happens is when you cook it, you take that carbo- a carbohydrate that is digestible yeah. and it changes its form okay. into an indigestible carbohydrate, which becomes a resistant starch. Interesting. And if you were recommending 
uh, to people how much, how many times per week would you okay. try? Well, even this study start? was giving people a supplement of resistant starch, which was equivalent to having one green banana a day. Okay. So like a, you, you obviously know what a green banana is. Right. Right. When you buy them, which is really, <laughs> this makes me laugh. Um, this makes me laugh a lot because I saw Paul Saladino. He did a video saying that green bananas are toxic because of resistant starch. <laughs> so if, uh, if uh, a 60% reduction in cancer is risk toxic. is toxic. considered I'll toxic, yeah. um, <laughs> I'll take it. Perhaps toxic isn't such a bad thing, Paul. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, that is quite funny. So, a green banana a day. All right. That's not right. that much. Like, if you think about it, and well, you know, it doesn't have to be. Anyone who's banana, eating a whole green. food plant based diet You're getting is getting it. that much resistant starch because oats, barley, rice, all of your legumes, these are all providing resistant starch. What if they're not um, cool, though? They still contain they still a fair it. bit. Okay. Um, but I do think having some, some uh, potatoes that have been cooled is. Sure. You know, is a is a great idea if you like them, work them in. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's this is not a, a study that I'm kind of highlighting, which is going to radically change many of the listeners' diet. Sure. But it's, it's helping explain, I think, why I think it's interesting is that um, we see diets like Mediterranean diet, for example, which has arguably the most research on it. Um, Time and time again, you see that that style of diet, which is very rich in plants, is associated with reduced risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and there are going to be many reasons. It's not that it's just resistant starch. Think about all of the polyphenols sure. and um, other compounds that are, are in plant foods. But this is just highlighting. It's just interesting that a study looked just at resistant starch and found such a significant effect. Yeah. Um, so I think that's neat. I'll, I'll link to that into the, uh, the show notes. So you think throwing a green banana in a smoothie would be an easy way to do it as well, right? Like, cause green bananas don't taste that good. Let's be honest. Yeah. They're furry. They're kind of a funny texture, yeah. but I imagine you could mask it in a smoothie quite easily. Right. Throw some berries in there, something sweet. I don't yeah. know, maybe a ripe banana and a green banana. Mm. If you, you could do that. Unless you want to, unless you're scared of too much fructose. I so. agree. I think that, I think it, the, the green bananas are, um, you know, they're not my idea no. of a Mind you, you can get really supplement, enjoyable green banana snack. supplement. Right, you can get the resistant powder. starch powder. Right. That's Do available that um, most places. That's awesome. Cool study. Mm. Um, so what was that? 60% reduction in, in cancer risk. That's solid. They took it for six years. Yeah. And then they stopped. And they stopped. And 10 years later, they had this. Improved. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Um, all right. I brought in a couple of studies, which they're actually very similar. So I can I can essentially race through these. But. These are, they were both published in 2021, uh, looking at very similar things. And these are in the- Resistance the, starch. The field of resistance exercise. Okay. A little different. We're on the uh, theme but, of resistance. And it's, it's very good for you in both scenarios. So the first study I want to talk about is, I'll read the title. The author was Sato, I believe. I'm sorry if I mm. mispronounced that. S-A-T-O. Okay. Published in 2021. Elbow joint angles- in elbow flexor unilateral resistance exercise training determine its effects on muscle strength and thickness of trained and non-trained arms. Okay. The biggest title in history. Hang on, hang on. Let's unpack this. I think we might need the <laughs> translator. Okay. Um, so here's the English version. Yeah. This study was looking at a bicep exercise. Okay. So elbow flexion. Training it at different lengths. So have you ever gone into the gym? And done biceps? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a great video. I've never posted it, but I saw it the other day. I paparazzied you in Bali. Oh, did you? Yeah, you were on your own, shirt off, sweating hard, cranking out biceps after your workshop. It was the middle of the night. It was like 9 p.m. Oh, no. And I was standing at the window. I'll put this up. I'll, I will not forget. I'm gonna it was this, so hot there. I'm going to put it in my stories. I don't train topless if there's anyone else in, he does. The, in the gym. It's like, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but I will say <laughs> there's a correlation between hotter, warmer weather, beach weather, and my bicep volume. Yeah, definitely. More, more yeah, bicep yeah. training. They get more volume. <laughs> That's true. You have to change your, your shirts every summer just to get some size there. So this study essentially, I'll put it in simple terms. It's looking at partial reps, okay? It's not looking at like, it, what I was going to say is if you ever walked in the gym and seen guys maybe not completing full range of motion repetitions and everyone, for some reason, we have this like 
our ego takes over and goes, ah, oh, bro, you're not doing full range of yeah, motion. Form police. Yeah, you're form police. Exactly. No, nah, man, not full range. What are you doing? You, you, you're wasting it. You're ego lifting. This is like the ultimate study to look at ego lifting and if it does anything, right? This is interesting. It's a great study. So what the, it's actually, there's two studies. I'm thinking of someone right now at the gym. Yeah. Well, what you, when you think of partial reps, so you can think of like, if people don't really know what I'm talking about, like let's say I've seen people doing lateral raises for deltoids and some guys just, just literally lift them from the sides of their body to like maybe 10 to 15 degrees, like just tiny little. Right reps. at the end. Right. Is there or any the benefit? Whole, the right? whole set. Some, some people do it from the start with a really heavy load. So they'll right. overload to the point where they, let's say your sticking point is at 45 mm. degrees and they can't get past that. They just pick a load that stops them at 45 and they just rep to there, right? So this, one, this study was looking at elbow flexion, so bicep curls, at, th so at three groups, randomized, right? They trained twice a week for five weeks and they did three sets of 10 for bicep curls. One group trained at long muscle lengths, okay? Meaning that, Imagine you're standing up with your arm by your side. I, I think they use preacher curl for this actually. So they're right. on that preacher curl machine. In a lengthened position. Yeah. So they start from that fully extended position and they only go to 50 degrees, zero to 50 degrees. Right. Okay. Short range of motion, but at a long muscle length. The bicep is under. And if that's on a preacher, there's a lot of tension on that. Yeah. At the bottom of that. Rep, at the bottom. Yeah. Another group trained at short muscle length, 80 degrees to 130. So that's that just up here, right? Mm. Where your bicep's a little bit more under that peak contraction right. where it's short at its shortest. My gut would tell me based on a preacher that's that's not getting as good a contraction. I'm really glad you brought this I up because be this is a huge limitation which we'll come to, right? And there was a control group that did nothing, all right? And they looked at strength and hypertrophy. Really interestingly, the longer muscle length partials create more hypertrophy than shorter length partials. Right. So we can think about, let's think about bench press from your chest to maybe just a couple inches above. Yeah, but those you are the bro still reps. have gravity. It's, it, it's a different to this exercise on a preacher though. Why? The muscle's still under tension at a long length. What, what's the difference? Uh, when you're in the, sh so when you're in the, on a bench press mm -hmm. in the shortened, so you're talking about the shortened, no, 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 sorry. I'm thinking about the wrong way. Yeah, so yeah. the long position yeah. is you're at the very bottom. Right. So the, the pec is lengthened when the bar is close to your chest. That's the longest your pec gets. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you trained from your chest to four inches right. or a few inches, that's the long length of pecs. For the bicep, it's when your arm is most right. straightened to a little bit yes. of a bend. Long length partials create more hypertrophy and strength than short partials. And this is the crazy part. They almost match full range of motion. So this theory sort of arised where if you do full range of motion curls versus just partials at a long length, you get the same, very similar hypertrophy and strength adaptations, which makes you think it's the, par it's the partial or the long length. Is that because on the preacher though, at the shortened? There's, there's an issue with the preacher. Right, that's, what, that's what I'm getting at between yes. that and the bench press. This is a right? good point. Because when you're in that real shortened on a preacher, I can almost just hold the weight there. If, you're the tension's if, if gone. your forearm's vertical on a preacher, right. there's no tension. That's what I mean. Set. Whereas a These bench press is different. Were, I'm certain they that they know this. There. They didn't let them go there. I'm certain. Um, but we must look into that a little bit. That's a great potential limitation. But- the takeaway here is not only was there more hypertrophy, but where it was, where the hypertrophy was, and it was more distal hypertrophy than proximal, which means the part of the bicep further away from the origin, so further away from the shoulder toward the elbow is where the cross-sectional area is. So if you improved. want the peak. So it can change, this is the point. You can literally change where you get hypertrophy in a bicep. So what they found was, Sold me. again. <laughs> Sold me. I'll so be what doing they found these was tiny half reps on the know, preacher. Well, well, I've got an idea of how to implement this. But I the, reckon this is Nemo's trick. He's mate. He probably only does long partials. He says it's genetics. I think that nah, he he's, he knows he's known about this study for years for sure. Uh, although it was just published. Um, so so the interesting parts, the, the takeaways here are that long length partials create more distal hypertrophy, but yeah. equal proximal hypertrophy to shortened mm. length partials. So if you just do the that shortened partial. You do get hypertrophy, but it's more proximal. Right. But the long length, you get both and you get more distal. So if you only did short partials in that little range, so let's imagine on a bench press, that would be from when your arms are fully extended to just dropping like little, uh, tiny little elbow yeah. bends, you don't get the distal hypertrophy, but you will get some shortened uh, proximal hypertrophy. But long length partials actually can cover all of those bases. So some people are now thinking, well, all of the benefit from full range training Stretch. is the stretch.
position. Mm. So then it's like, well, then are we wasting energy even Super going to the short lengths? Do yeah. we should we just do long partials? You might even be able to lift a high, more. So another study. I'll quickly go through this. This is um, this for me sort of hammers home this message because if it was just one study showing that, before it's you not get good to enough. that next study, yeah, sure. How many times? Do you know how many times that study that you just picked up has been downloaded or? Uh, I would not have a clue. I think they should change a couple of things in their title, right? <laughs> the elbow flexion type of uh, descriptor, just call it a bicep curl. <laughs> just see, like, the, if you I want know. more people to look at this paper, out with the, the yeah. lingo, have the elbow flexion in the paper, but yeah. in the title, You're probably right. bicep curl. And secondly, talk about the bicep peak. Yeah. If you talk about those two things, <laughs> Dude, this you, article it, is going to <laughs> to be be far wider reach. You're talking to the bros. These these people are writing for the science community. They don't care. Sure. But bicep peaks. I know, but care. but bros, you know, cop a lot of flack. But guess what? They do. They actually help disseminate. They help spread a lot of science. It's so true. So if you have good science, they might misinterpret it. And sure. But a, lo a lot of these studies are hypothesized off the back of seeing bros in right. the natural habitat. Yeah, so it's not... Doing partials. Right. Right. So you've got a point. The second study, okay, if this title's a little bit more easy to understand. Partial range of motion training elicits favorable improvements in muscular adaptations when carried out at long muscle lengths. This is by Pedroza. Okay, but let me tell you what the study was. Four groups. Again, they trained three times a week. This one was for 12 weeks, so a bit longer than the other one, which was five weeks. They did three sets of seven. Um, at the start of the study and as the weeks progressed, they ended up getting six sets of seven per exercise. So the groups were full range of motion. And by the way, this is on, this is knee uh, extension. Okay. So like a, a um, like a quad, quad exercise. Yep. Full range of motion, bottom half, top half, alternating both. So mm. session to session and a control group. So imagine you're on the leg extension machine and we're going to cap your range of motion from when your knee is the most bent to just to, so I can't remember the exact degrees that they used here, but imagine just that, that half from most bent to say, let's just say, let's call it 90 degrees, right? Of, of knee extension um, versus the top half where it's, where your shortened. leg's straight out. Yeah, that's the shortened position. So your mm -hmm. leg's straight out. You only come down a little bit and go straight out again, right? Oh. What would your intuition tell you? Who's going to get the most hypertrophy? Gosh, well. Because I, I can tell you what I would have thought before reading this study. I, I'm almost going to say the second one, that eccentric load's going to be big, that first bit. So when you go from shortened and you start lengthening it, there's a lot of eccentric loading right there. I'm probably wrong. You, you, you are unfortunately wrong. This, the results were the same. So as a previous study. You have differences in regional hypertrophy depending on which rep range you're in. Sorry, not rep range, which um, range degrees, of range of motion that you're in. The proximal hypertrophy was similar between both all groups, but the distal hypertrophy was the biggest in the group that was at the, the long partials. So we only use the long partials. Yes, long partials. So basically said, said differently, the part of your quad around your knee Correct. responded better to, long to the lengthened part of the, not the top part where you squeeze right at the top. Correct. So that's counterintuitive. That's what I said. So when yeah. I read this, so as soon as I saw that title even, I'm thinking it's, it's obvious. You need the peak contraction where the muscle's the shortest to, to, to sort of grow the biggest. Right. But I was so wrong. It's actually it's the counterintuitive to kind of where you feel it because when you get to the top, the shortened position, I don't know if you're the same as me, but I really feel that contraction on at the, at the level of the knee, right near the distal. The, yeah, the distal okay, part. So I don't, and I'll tell you how I sort of figured this out on my own. Let's say I do a set of leg extensions. When I'm done, when I cannot reach full range of motion because I'm under so much fatigue and I'm approaching failure, I just do partials at the bottom. I just push right. it out yeah. and I get an unbelievable burn in my VMO towards my knee. Interesting. So it, it, for people, if you want to try this practically in the gym, guys like and gals, so think about this. Get on the leg extension machine. You can do your full range of motion reps. When you get so fatigued that you can't get full range anymore, squeeze out as many partials at the bottom at, as far as you can go until you're just done. You terminate the set. You can do this on bicep curls, lateral raises, leg, everything. You can do this anywhere. So I, I recommend it on machines rather than free weights because 
try doing this on a squat, you're in trouble. That's the bottom of a squat. You don't want to be doing that. Right. Um, but machines is safe and easy. Definitely. So this could be this could be something. There could mm. be something there. So they do think that long length partials are beneficial. It's really interesting. Um, when you know the tricep machine, we sound like massive bros right now. <laughs> but <laughs> I know the one. I know the one. You know the tricep machine where you hold onto it and you do that. Yeah. I always finish that with partial reps in the lengthened. Some exercises. And and actually, a friend of mine, Rich, he he actually had me doing that. He's like, when you when you can't do any more, he's like, do another five partial reps. Yep. In that length in position, um, yeah, and yeah, some, still haven't grown triceps, but dude, it's fun. You got some horseshoes there, but um, you can also do this. Yeah, I think lateral raise is an interesting one. So full range, try bring them up to that ninety degree, and when you when you're stuck, right. even just those little flapping like a baby bird, yeah. like you can't quite get those arms up. You're still going to get some stimulation. Leave the ego at the door. But I will just say that what I've just said there, I've, I've sort of extrapolated what you can take out of these and applied it. If you want to do it how these studies are done, they don't do the full range and then the partials. You just stick to that partial range the whole time. Right. The all reps. But it sounds like range. different parts of the range are affecting different parts of the muscle. So if you're looking to train the entire muscle, still a full range is going to be beneficial. It will be, but you still get the same proximal hypertrophy doing partials mm. as the shorten. Did you see what I mean? Which is mm. why it's, it's – so some physiologists have come out and go, well, mm. if you get the same benefit doing just the long length – why don't we just do long length training? I don't know if you get the same connective tissue benefits as well. I don't know. I, I would not <laughs> put all my chips in on partials. just do partials. I would absolutely go full range. But this is what I wanted to say. There is a guy on Instagram who's become very famous, gone viral for many of the wrong reasons, for only doing short length partials. Okay? So he's, his whole thing is he's a, he's a PhD Exercise scientist, mm. I believe. Oh, short length partials. Only short. He says anything beyond 90 degrees of joint angle. But that's opposite of what you're saying. Kills your knees, terrible for your joints. You okay. don't get the same hypertrophy. We should just be doing half squats, right? Then all these sports scientists have come out and go, actually, mate, if you look at the literature, it's the complete opposite is true. But is he right from a, uh, a, a joint kind of, perspective? Yeah, I a don't joint. know. He could be. He could, this is looking at hypertrophy and strength. Very different outcome. And it might also, are we talking about a, a closed chain or an open chain exercise? So are you loaded? Closed. And wet, if you're weight bearing, then correct. Good it's point. different from a joint point of view to say the preacher curl doing bicep. Very good point. He, he implements these with squats. So squat to right. halfway, uh, pull-ups, don't pull past halfway. So he's saying like if you squat and you go really deep, then you're, 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 you're putting your, your knees under a, a lot of stress. Correct. That and perhaps you don't need to. Correct. And then he says you can get all the same hypertrophy from just doing halfway. Mm. But these studies would say that yeah. may not be true. I don't think he's, what he's saying sounds like the evidence-based position. It's not the evidence-based position, but he does train elite NFL players. Um, and he's been working with athletes for a long time. And he's mm. got some anecdotes of people saying, you know, my knees were shot ever since I've changed to your training program. I can load, I can load with super heavy weight and just do short and partials and I, you know, my knees feel fine. So... Who knows? Um, but yeah, it's food for thought anyway. Well, it sounds like these studies though would have, if, if at least what he's saying about strength or hypertrophy was accurate, you'd think that the studies that you just presented would have seen the shortened position that was superior. Correct. Right? It's not to say that some of the things he says, might, they might be right. Maybe, he'll, there, there maybe he'll do some studies. But I think this just goes back to the idea that there's so many ways to train. Let's just do a little bit of everything. If you really right. want to cover your bases, do it all. Mm. There was one more little interesting finding, which I'll quickly talk about before we move on. There's a cross-education effect, meaning the trained limb, so they only trained one limb, had benefits for the untrained, the contralateral limb. So let's say we're only training our right arm bicep. You're going to get benefit in your left arm bicep. So you get improvements in strength and hypertrophy, even in the muscle that you didn't do anything with. So it is just, it's just so interesting to see how the body works when you do this kind of mm. unilateral. That's the body saying, I don't want to be out of balance Out here. of balance. Yeah. And, and it also shows you that the Come stimulus- Come back to homeostasis. The stimulus is, while there's a local stimulus, it has a systemic effect. Mm -hmm. If you have a broken arm for whatever reason, don't neglect the other arm. Just train the arm you can and you might get some carryover or cross education. Okay. Get it off your chest. 
Do you have anything this to get is, off this your is, chest? This is your favorite segment. I love this so Let's much. just make it clear. Oh. This was a segment you brought to the table. Yeah. I have people inboxing me all the time now. What they do is they, <laughs> they set me up, they tag me in something, and then they inbox or they inbox me something and yeah. say, maybe this could be your next get it off your chest. Yeah. What they're basically doing is they're taking the pin out of the grenade and just rolling it into the room. And they're like, yeah. Here we go, boys. And, so, and, and the one that I have today, actually, yes, that's thank you to whoever sent that to me. Oh, okay. Bear Grylls. He's back. He's back. We keep having repeat offenders. I know. Mind you, I could have, I mean, I sort of got it off my chest before with Paul Saladino and Resistant Starch, but um, yeah. That, what's, Bear, what's, what's Bear Grylls doing? Go on. Get so Bear chest. Grylls, uh, I was tagged in something and you know, he, it always puzzles me as to why people put so much stock into what someone like Bear Grylls is saying about his diet. Um He's, you know, he, he's, he's not reading studies, to my knowledge, he's, he's not a scientist. Um, and I think he came out, he did a GQ interview, he said, and uh, this is a quote, I was a massive advocate of the vegan lifestyle for years and wrote a book on it. Um, I'm super against nuts, against grains, wheat and vegetables, they affected my health. Anyway, I thought it was interesting that, firstly, that he said he wrote a book on vegan lifestyle. Now, if I've missed it, because I've gone through and tried yeah. to dig it up, I couldn't find any book on um, vegan lifestyle. What I could find was a cookbook, right, that had a couple of vegan recipes in it, but the book was called Fuel for Life. And again, if I've missed this, and he has a book on vegan lifestyle, which is what he said, I was a massive advocate of the vegan lifestyle for years and wrote a book on it. Mm -hmm. To me, that sounds like you've dedicated a book to that topic. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, I thought, well, I'm, maybe I'll get his cookbook. Maybe he's got <laughs> a plant-based cookbook that I could use. Anyway, um, I looked through it and, you know, there's uh, South Indian chicken recipes, there's venison pie <laughs> recipes, there's buffalo burger recipes. And I thought, maybe I got the wrong book. Um, but yeah, there was also, what I found was really interesting was, the, in, in his introduction, I think this says a lot. Um, and I love a lot of stuff that Bear Grylls has done. So this is not me picking on him. I think it's more uh, I'm trying to, um, I guess, help people understand that we, sometimes we just need to use common sense. Who, who, where are we going for nutrition information? And are we going to believe everything that's posted online? Um, you know, he, he has in his introduction, he says, whatever I did, however much I trained like a monster or adopted the latest Atkins fad, mind you, he's now doing the carnivore diet, which is just another version of the Atkins fad. Mm. I could never get lean, strong, happy, and healthy all at the same time. Whatever I did, whether training harder or eating less or changing when I ate or mixing carbs and proteins differently or eating according to my blood type, you name it, nothing worked beyond the occasional short-term blip. Mm -hmm. So... You know, this is a guy who has been jumping from, it seems, from diet to diet. Um, he's tried the blood type diet, of which I believe there's not much evidence for. Mm. Um, it sounds to me like he doesn't have a good team around him that are explaining the evidence. Um, and as a re result, he hasn't really had the results that he's, he's, he's wanted. Um, he says, but there was still a problem. The food I really enjoyed was the unhealthy stuff. I was still having to be really disciplined and determined to eat right because it tasted so boring and it didn't help that I hated vegetables. So he's, he's said in here, you know, he's jumped from diet to diet. He hates vegetables. And of course now he's come across and become friends with people like Paul Saladino who tell him what he wants to hear. Mm. But guess what? These foods that you don't like are actually unhealthy. So for someone like Bear Grylls, and I'm sure that there are many people that hate vegetables, when you come across someone who is now telling you, you know, you don't need to eat these, mm. you can just double down on the foods that you love. Yeah. Um, you can see how that's an attractive message. Yeah. So, um, so he's, was he vegan at any point? I'm so, I'm confused. Let's let the listeners go and, and look for, I couldn't find any Wait, evidence. was his cookbook vegetarian or not? No. His, well, his book had South Indian chicken. So maybe it had like pie. a vegetarian recipe in there somewhere. Maybe, but he said, I, I wrote a book on it. I was a massive advocate of the vegan lifestyle for years and wrote a book on it. That's okay. a quote in the CQ, in the GQ magazine. Yeah. That's what kind of ruffled feathers okay. and then had people tagging me. So now he's carnival. Is that correct? Right. 
So he's f like full blown. He's gone the Saladino. My concern is he has a huge reach. He's it's clear he jumps from diet to diet. He's he's written that in his book. Yeah. Um, he's gone as far as trying things like the blood type diet. And look, I just gave you an example of resistant starch, right? And what was the interesting thing about that study was that you did a diet mo modification and it took 10 years follow-up to see the so, outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I want people to understand is that there are a lot of people online getting um, a lot of attention, sharing information that um, is the, the underlying motive is not always your health yeah. or, or improving your health, mm. right? There are other motives and incentives to put information out that may not reflect the best evidence we have. Mm. And it, you might be making choices today, which I believe people are if they're eating a pound, a two pounds of red meat a day, like is being recommended in that group, that come back to bite you in the ass yeah. in 10, 20 years time when you have much higher risk of developing cancer, for example. And if his trend continues, the carnivore diet that he's on today might not be the diet he's eating in a year from now. Like if he's not going to adhere to that one, what's next? Right. So are we going to invest into, this is what I, I saw, I saw a post, Plant Based News put a post up. I, I left a comment, something like, if I have an issue with my car, I go to see a mechanic. If I need help with plumbing, I call a plumber. If I need nutrition advice, I don't go to a TV star. Yet the TV star is the person who has the reach and influence and he's literally changing the diet of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. Mm. Without any accountability. Without any, correct. That's and the main thing. if he comes out in six months and goes, actually guys, I'm not carnivore anymore. My cholesterol's through the roof. I had a scare, health scare. Well, what if the people who are on that diet continue and didn't hear about mm. it? You know, it's just, I wouldn't, as, as I wouldn't tell anyone what to do anyway. As, um, I know I do talk about my diet a bit, but if I'm going to tell people what to do, it's going to be an evidence-based It's going to be position. consistent with the guidelines. Right. So that if your recommendations change in 10 years' time, yeah. when you look back, the recommendations you were giving then were consistent with the guidelines. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Whilst you the weren't risk, recommending a blood-type diet. Or a diet that is literally the opposite of the guideline. Like, actually, don't worry about the guidelines, guys. Try this opposite diet. It's just, it's a risky move. To my so, knowledge, there's two studies on the carnivore diet. One, I think I spoke about before, which was a five-day study, which, yeah. which showed the all-animal-based diet had very deleterious effects on the microbiome. And second one, which was a survey of a carnivore group on Facebook. Right. So like a self-selected group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the problem with that is, look, it's an interesting first step, but you get highly motivated people filling out the survey because you go into a Facebook group and say, hey, we we're looking for information on carnivore dieters. You've missed all all of the people that have failed on that diet that yeah, aren't there. Yeah. Right. So you've just got such a skewed look into typical outcomes, Selection how bias, people are feeling. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. um, Bear grills. I got it off my chest. <laughs> Feels good. Good. Um, yeah, I can understand why that can annoy you, uh, especially after all the work you do to give the opposite message. And then a guy like that with a gazillion followers just says, hey guys, just start eating testicles and liver and you're going to be the healthiest strongest, leanest person in the world. And I mean, that would have been one thing, but then to add on to that, that he was a massive advocate of the vegan lifestyle and wrote a book on it. Mm. If that's not true. Yeah, that's a problem. I agree. All right. Um, so for me, get it off your chest. I actually don't feel like I need to get this off my chest anymore because it was so long ago, but it's a topic worth talking about. Um, you were there throughout the whole thing. We were in Bali and so basically to fill people in after the retreat, Simon and I spent another week in Bali, unwinding, surfing, eating great food, training every day. And a passion of mine, which I think a lot of people already know, is I absolutely love not just dogs, all animals, but in particular dogs. And I've got a dog, Dennis, who I'm obsessed with, who has his own Instagram account, go follow him. And I love dogs and seeing the situation in Bali broke my heart. Seeing so many dogs on the streets, you know, completely malnourished, many dying in poor, poor health. And it just, it made me so upset. It was, it was heartbreaking to see. So I thought, you know what, I'm here for a week. The least I can do is try feed some of the dogs where possible. These dogs are literally fight, fighting for scraps. Mm. 
to try and make it another day out there. It's, it's really survival of the fittest. So I went and bought some food to go feed the dogs and I posted a couple of little videos. I posted, to be honest, I fed the dogs every day and I posted like two videos. Mm. Um, I wasn't doing it for And I think reason. we also asked locals what to feed them. Yeah, yeah. We, we asked some locals and they gave us some suggestions. So we went to the you know, little local stores that we could find, got some food. So we got some, the food that, that, that I ended up buying was canned food because it can last the longest. I can take it with me on the scooter, in my bag. I can travel with it. It's between villas. Go, between villas, whatever it may be. So I got cans of tuna and I started to feed these dogs and seeing these dogs eat, it was very heartwarming. I mean, some of them, it was actually incredible how they, they have a feeding hierarchy, which I only figured out when I was feeding them on the street, but you could see which dog mm. was the one who, who was getting all the food because they were the least underweight and they ate first. And then the really, really skinny dogs who were at the bottom of the pecking order, they would finish it off. So what I would try to do is actually distract the, the, the bigger dogs who have been eating quite well with a little bit of food here. And then I'd give the skinny dogs their own big meal. And watching these dogs gobble up this food was amazing. And I thought I was doing a great thing and it felt good and I was happy to see it. And then my inbox started to get flooded with... You're a bad boy. Yeah. You're a naughty boy. <laughs> Pretty much. I was getting... I don't want to say attacked, but I was definitely getting scrutinized for feeding the dogs. There were two, there were two, <laughs> there were two reasons why these people were getting upset. Number one, I'm not vegan anymore, apparently. Okay. I bought tuna to feed the dogs. Okay. So there, guys, I've just said it. I'm not vegan anymore. I bought tuna. Okay. <laughs> so I was feeding these dogs tuna and then some people was like, mate, you're just not vegan anymore. I thought you were vegan. Like, how dare you? This is ridiculous. You know, you could have literally, this is what I said. You should have given them rice. Mate. Well, firstly, when was the last time you fed stray dogs on the mm. street? Like how many people are going out of their way to do this? There are a lot of people. People message me, right. they do it too. But for, for the most part, mm. and if we, you do it. we look at a problem, we see it, it hurts us, it breaks our heart and we move right. on. Out of sight, out of mind. I actually thought, I'm going to do something about right. this, right? And not the dogs with the collars. I did feed Dobie. Our, right. There our was a couple, but I mean, couple, the, yeah. the focus was on dogs without Correct. collars. Correct. Dogs that were really, really street dogs struggling. Right. I found a dog with a puppy, a tiny little puppy. I'm sure the rest of the litter had already died. There was one left and I was like, I'm just going to feed this mother so it can actually provide mm. milk for the How good was Dobie? Oh, Dobie. I miss little Dobie. We, oh, we could go gosh. back and find him. Yeah. It's know there. It yeah. He's in the same spot every day. 100%. Great dog, Doberman, 13 years old, beautiful dog. Um, anyway, so I'm not vegan anymore. There, I've said it, I'm on the record. I fed a dog tuna. Um, I should have fed the dog rice apparently. <laughs> when really I fed it a food that it will get more protein and more calories in that meal than it probably would have got in the last three weeks. Mm. You know, So that, that was my logic. Give it a very energy dense, high protein meal, something it's never had before. The other thing that people were saying was it's against Balinese culture. Now, I haven't unpacked this one, and they may be right in some way, but I didn't see any locals who had a problem with this. I asked the locals right. to feed dogs fish. Okay, well, where that's a little bit confusing, you might, yeah. and you might be right. Maybe, that maybe we look into it. Yeah. No, no, we, I don't know the answer. Oh, you don't know the answer. But okay. what I'm saying is um, they could be right. We can look into that. Yeah. But where – in our defense a little bit, yeah. the first villa we went to, actually it was the Balinese guy that was looking after the villa that went and got the food for us yes. and first came back with tuna. Right, because there was a cat that came into our villa right. and was meowing at us to feed it. We gave it tuna. And then I was like, well, now that we've got all this tuna, let's- I'm not blaming that guy. Dog. What I'm saying no. is the fact that he bought that- Yeah. And also- That kind fact, of suggests to me that it's not a cultural issue. And the fact that there's tuna on shelves in every single- 7-Eleven or whatever you want to call it, Easy Mart, Quickie Mart. Mm. We might be ignorant to something. We though. might be. We might be. But we're also, we're tourists doing our best. We don't know, mm. right? So apparently there was an issue there that it's a very much a plant-based culture and to be feeding fish to dogs is disrespectful to the people. I can and I was, kind of see that. Same. I was, I was looking at it. I was, I was Because it. It, maybe it's a very expensive food mm. for them and they can't afford it. They're right. not plant-based for their health. Yeah. It's out of necessity. Mm. That is what they can afford right? 
So they're not fully plant based. Like if you look, there, right. there's a lot of fried chicken places that popped course. up. And but but those pork. are mainly for the tourists. But if you look at what the locals are actually eating, right? Someone told me this in, in, in a long message, which I'm very grateful for. I can't remember who it was, but they sort of educated me a bit. The locals do eat predominantly plant based. Yeah, most of their calories come from rice, and I don't know what else. But it's out of necessity. It's not because mm. they're choosing it for health options or whatever. And if they could afford fish or chicken, they would eat it where possible. And for me to then go feed it to the dogs was disrespectful. Mm. I can kind kind of see it. I can kind of see it. But I also think, guys, if you see someone doing something out of the good of their heart, they're trying their best. Do you have to go and slam them for it? It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Yeah. Do you really have to do that? Can you just let it be and be like, mate, thanks for feeding the dogs? I just think we need more love in the world. So... Um, any step in that direction is a good one. So that's it, mate. It's off my chest. I moved on long ago, but that felt kind of good too anyway. <laughs> would you do it again? <laughs> what, feed the dogs? Tuna. I would. Yeah. I'll do it again. Well, unless that's... unless you can give me a really right. strong reason to feed the dogs rice, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll move on to rice. But for the ease of cans of tuna, I would do it again mm-hmm. and to see how much I may have affected these dogs' lives. Okay. However, there's another option, which I only realized after we left. I could have gone to the pet store and got dog food, which is all over the shelves there, and I could have scattered it over the streets. Mm-hmm. That's another option. Maybe I'll do that next time. Mm-hmm. Okay? So I'm open. I'm open. Cool. <laughs> okay. I love how we go from that to just good news straight away. Let's go good <laughs> news of the week. <laughs> Flip the coin. I think getting it off your chest, is. You, I think that deep down makes you happy. I love it. I do it every day privately to you anyway, so. Okay. Well, we've got a couple of good things to share here. Yeah. The first one, I'll give you the honor of doing that because that's uh, okay. That's big news. And relevant to this this show. Right. Um, so I've been talking about CGMs on every episode. It's now the CGM podcast. And today we're not going to talk about them in detail, but we are going to just say one little bit of good news, which is that CGMs in Australia are now subsidized for people with diabetes of all ages. Previously, it was for people under the age of, I think it was 18. Now, myself included and a lot of other people, hundreds of thousands in fact, can now get CGMs at a subsidized price. So what does it end up, say, costing you? I'm actually still in the process of getting this um, approved. My application's gone in. I don't know what the final number is. It was currently, it's currently before this, sorry, previously it was around about four to $5,000 a year to wear a CGM. Now, I believe it's 30 bucks a month. Okay. Much more manageable. Much more manageable. It may be zero for people under 18 still. I think it mm-hmm. is, maybe. I'm not exactly sure. So I need to check the details. All I know is it is subsidized now. The government have jumped on board and people with diabetes are, are taken care of. So huge news, not just for me, but for so many people. So I'm really happy about that news. Amazing. Yeah, it's good. YouTube, I just want to thank the audience. Like I'm starting now uh, to see more and more people jump over there, Mm. which is really great, jumping in, leaving comments. Um, So there's a lot of work that goes into producing those videos. Obviously, I wasn't doing it before episode 200. Yeah. Um, So now the full-length videos are up there. The team works really hard, so it's great to see uh, people over there and and they seem to be finding them beneficial. I don't know. You watch them on YouTube sometimes. Yeah, I just prefer – like if I can watch a podcast in visual form, I always choose that. Yeah. I try to do it with most of them. Um, the only tricky thing is it's like when you're driving, and maybe I'm I'm just so tech unsavvy. How do you have your screen locked and still listen to it or watch it? Do you know yeah, what I mean? That's that's one of the It's a problem. You have to subscribe to the premium. Oh, okay. If you want to play YouTube with the the um phone locked. Okay. All right. right? That's the only issue. Um and that also gets rid of ads. Yeah. It's because YouTube put ads in all videos. Yeah, okay. If you're not subscribed, yeah, okay. I think their subscription is like ten or fifteen dollars a month. Um, but yeah, that is like one of the the pain points. Yeah, but at the same time, if you're watching it, you're doing it because you need your screen open. You're going to be watching the screen. Right. So, no, I, I love it. I think it's awesome. Um, like I said, I try to watch most podcasts. I just feel like, unless like if, even if I'm on the bike at the gym, I just stick my phone in and I can watch a, a podcast, do some learning at the same time. Because sometimes the tone can be missed if you don't see the person's Definitely. face. Yeah. You know, especially sure. when you're listening to like comedians like on, on Rogan or sometimes yeah, I listen yeah. to your mom's house pod and those sorts of things. If you can see a comedian deliver a funny joke and see their face, it takes it to another level. Yeah. And I, and I try, not try, 
the in the video format, whenever we talk about a study, at least the major studies we're talking about, it comes up on the screen so that if someone wants to to quickly look that up via the sort of PubMed ID number, it's very easy to do that. So that's kind of another benefit to to watching them. Cool. Um, cool. Let's finish with podcast, show, book recommendations. Let's leave people mm-hmm. with a, a few resources to go and check out. I actually took a break from educational mm-hmm. science podcast because I feel like my brain is just, right. I'm full. Dude, I've got no mm-hmm. more space left to retain information that it's actually making me dumber. So <laughs> I've gone to like the most simple podcasts ever where I can just sit back and laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, so I listened I listened to Two Bears, One Cave, mate. This It's as low and filthy as you're going to get, but for some people they won't like it, but I just for me it's like funny. Two Bears, One Cave. One Cave. Tom Segura, Bert Kreischer, two comedians. Right hilarious um great banter and then i listened to um or i watched ricky gervais's new special on netflix so if you're easily offended maybe don't watch it um if you don't mind getting offended it's the one of the funniest specials i've ever heard i think he's absolutely brilliant he's um he's good for offending people oh he's the he's a master um what about you yeah i man i'm the same like in terms of needing to to stop listening and reading so much at certain periods. I go to football though. Yeah. Football's my outlet. Sport, me too. Right? Yeah. Um, so there's a few big games this weekend, but I'm not going to recommend that for folks listening. That They're, they're going to watch Jamie Elliott's. They're going to watch that kick. Two-minute final kick. Yes. Um, and report back. Let me know what you think. Yeah. Um, so podcasts that I would recommend, uh, The Brain Health Revolution. So this is a show run by Dean and Aisha Scherzai. Okay. Um, they've been on the show many times before, neurologists, friends of mine from California. Actually, I recorded an episode with them. It'll be out soon. Amazing episode on exercise oh, cool. and long-term brain health. Um, anyway, they just released an episode. So this is the Brain Health Revolution on fraud and fabrication in Alzheimer's research. I don't know the full story, um, but there has been an uh, investigation into some original research that paved the way for research that that costed hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars after the initial research. And there may have been, the allegations are that there was some fraud and some fabrication involved in the early research. So a bit of a spicy one there to to listen to. I think it's a 50-minute episode or so. But it provides some context to some things that you may see in the media. Um, and I think hearing that from two neurologists um, that are very highly uh, respected and published in that space um, makes for a really interesting listen. Mm. And then also two podcasts that I've been on recently that I thought people may want to go and check out and listen to. Um, I did a show with Dean and Zach from A Little More Good. So these guys are really cool guys based in Canada. And then the Food Matters podcast with James. I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I know I'll get it wrong. Mm-hmm. But um, I'll put both of those, all of these that um, we've just discussed, I'll put into the show notes. Awesome. How do you feel? Hey, how long's it been? It's a short one for us. What is it? Two and a half hours. <laughs> Solid. No, that's awesome. We covered so much. Um, yeah. And we left plenty of room to dive deeper into so many of those topics as well, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I said there um, for people to leave comments, send us messages mm. in any of these areas, whether it is resistance training or HIT mm. or zone two training, lactate threshold testing. If you're interested, you want to learn more, mm. let us know, send us your questions and we can use those to kind of help guide future episodes. Yeah, just to reiterate, it really does help because I get private ones, you get private ones, but if everyone just leaves them on the YouTube video, right. so much we can just scroll through, pick them out. Yeah, we can read them on air and answer them, or, or yeah. maybe it'll just trigger our. I think our that's mind. the easiest spot. It's easy for us to go back to consolidate them well. in one place. YouTube comments. Right. We, we I can because I can't see your DMs. Done. But I can I can go to the YouTube yeah. and just scroll through the comments. So, there you go, guys. There Please it is. go Please to YouTube. It. Awesome. That was a good plug. All right, guys. We'll see you in uh, October in yeah. uh, in Bali. That's right. <laughs> Journey retreats. Can't wait. Let's do it. On the beach. Lots of sun. Awesome. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. 
If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.